Good day, everybody. Welcome to another episode of High Side, Low Side. This is Season 5, Episode 5. Zach Quartz here, along with, as always, Spurgeon Dunbar. It is a pleasure to be here with you. We are going to be talking about off-road motorcycle racing, oh. I believe. Is that not correct, Zach? That That's correct. So, more specifically, um, we started talking about what is the best racing to watch, like, or the best motorcycle competitions, the best things to spectate either in person or on TV. And we thought, what is the best spectacle in motorcycle racing? When is it most interesting to watch things? And then we thought we should really split up pavement and dirt. So this is the off-road edition of the best spectacles in motorcycle racing. Our guest today will be none other than Brandon Wise. You know him from Ride Tested. Uh, reviews on the Revzilla YouTube channel. Um, and then, of course, we'll do all the usual stuff with, um, you know, giving away a T-shirt and talking about news and addressing some of your lovely listener comments. Yeah, I would say, you know, it, yeah, it's it's interesting because I think, you know, the question comes up a lot of times with uh, street racing. And I think, um, you know, from a pavement side of things, we'll get there. But I think from a orderly <laughs> standpoint, like off-road racing arguably kind of came first in a lot of ways. So I think it makes sense to, you know, go back and, and, and think about this from a you know, historical mm. standpoint. Sure, sure. Yeah, unless I'm the, unless I'm wrong on that, but like I think <laughs> I feel like no, I feel I think like it's probably accurate. Roads came later. Yeah, yeah. I think the roads <laughs> the roads were wheels, not even basically. built yet. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> before we get into all the fun stuff, we do need to get in a word from our sponsor, Motul. And that, uh, that is true. And I, I gather you have a treat for for the ladies and gentlemen today. I do, and I have a treat for you, Zach. So we had a, a really oh, interesting review come through on Apple iTunes <laughs> from one Colonel Sanders up in New York. Podcast, excuse us. Sorry, Apple Podcast. Um, <laughs> and uh, and Colonel Sanders, I'm assuming he's either um, you know heritage to a chicken fortune, or perhaps he is a Civil War reenactor, and he has earned the rank of Colonel. Um, Almost certainly the latter, yeah. but in any, in any case. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Colonel Sanders is kind of you know doing a little hostage negotiation with us on uh, on his <laughs> particular review, and one of his one of his terms. Not that Zach and I like to negotiate uh, with uh, you know hostage. You know, I'm not going to say the word terrorist because that sounds aggressive. <laughs> you know. No, uh, that is official high side, low side policy. We do not negotiate with terrorists, unfortunately. It's a, it's, it's a difficult stance to take, but we have to take it. Yeah, we've lost many a good men on that policy, and women too, <laughs> we but we, we don't stop. <laughs> so anyway, okay. back to Motul sponsoring the podcast. So <laughs> one of the demands from Colonel Sanders was that he wanted Zach to get his box of goodies. So Zach, what I have for you is I have got your box that I've been promising you for, for years. Uh, Look, now. there it is. Yeah. I can see it on the video call. Wow. Yeah. So if you're looking at the video, there is a giant cardboard box on the table. So what's in the cardboard box? Uh, let me show you. Yeah, we've got okay. Motul 7100 oil for you in a, in a big four-quart jug. This is going to be perfect for your KTM. <laughs> okay. Um, Did you say 7100? What is it? It's, that's it's 1030 or something? 10 to be 40? No, 7100 is the Motul line of fully synthetic oil before you get up into the gotcha. 300V line. The 300V line is their race stuff. Uh, the 7100 is more for like everyday use, but it is a full synthetic because I care about your engine. <laughs> okay. You're, you're then getting some uh, some chain lube, which is road specific, because I know that you don't take that beauty queen off road. You have other bikes oh, for not that. Not so much. Yeah, true. You'll you'll, yes. you'll borrow okay. an S one thousand RR press bike and take that off road before you take your KTM off road. That's these. This is true. It all sounds crazy, but this is true. If you haven't seen one of the more recent uh, uh, Daily Rider episodes, you don't know what I'm talking <laughs> about. You should keep up with Zach's programming more often. And then we've got, uh, for when you bring that S1000RR back, we've got <laughs> Moto Wash for you. And All right, okay. This stuff is actually, this stuff I like a lot. It keeps bikes shiny and clean. And then let's see what else we got in here. Yeah, show me, show me what else we got in the box there. That's already a lot. I'm already feeling Perfect very leather fortunate. cleaner. You can use this on your race leathers. You can use this on your leather jackets. Yeah, you know, if, you're, right. if your wife has any leather shoes or garments, you can use this for that too. She, she did actually just get a leather jacket, so that's exciting. See? There you go. And the final piece here is some wash and wax spray. Uh, this is a dry cleaner and protective wax, so uh, you can actually, when you're, when you're done hosing the bike down and it's dried off, or if you want to do a little wash and waxing in between big, deep cleans, you can use this on, on your fairings and your plastics. And there's multiples of everything in this, in this box. So wow. So all of this Goodness. from Motul is coming for you, Mr. Quartz. Well, uh... Yeah, that's very exciting. I'm 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 glad to to see that it's actually in a box. It seems like if it just gets taped up and an address gets put on it, then 
we're going to be we're going to be in business here. I'll actually have my my Motul gift bag finally. There you go. So, uh, Colonel okay. Sanders, if you're listening, we've done our part uh, <laughs> as much as I'm going to do for you. Uh, again, right. we're not. I'm not. I'm not saying we're negotiating here, but I am just showing you <laughs> a little uh, a little goodwill uh, effort on our part. So. There you go. Motul is, again, the sponsor for High Side, Low Side. We thank them for everything they do, the fun that they allow us to have. And, uh, yeah, if you're supporting uh, Motul, you're also supporting High Side, Low Side. And Zach and I thank you for it. Indeed. On the topic of Apple Podcasts, if um, you take the time to go to uh, the Apple Podcast platform and leave us a uh, review, then you could be selected because Ooh. of the... Uh, entertainment value or or general flattery of your review uh to win a t-shirt and this time around the winner is sean f is that right Spurge? it's sean f question mark right sean f sean f yeah yeah <laughs> Sean, Sean F. Question mark, uh, writes in to say, love the show. Um, because of you and other YouTubers, I have bought my first bike, a 2008 Ninja 250, and fixed it up and made it road worthy with a carb rebuild. Learning more and more with every episode and every ride. Thanks for creating great content. Always look forward to new stuff from you guys. So tip of the cap to Sean F. Question mark. Um, uh, because this is a, this is a fun call out. Obviously we, we like to hear that we're, we're adding, um, some, some threads to the fabric of Sean F's motorcycling experience, but also, uh, also a friendly reminder that, um, you know, other, other programming on YouTube, whether it's a shop manual, um, uh, or whatever other educational programs on YouTube have uh, taught Sean lots of stuff about his 2008 Ninja 250. And, uh, he's off and running. And I think that that deserves a high side, low side t-shirt. Gosh, darn it. Absolutely. I think especially too, when you think back to when you and I started riding and, um, you know, before YouTube. Yeah, I mean it's it sounds weird, but you know you. now you know it is easy to to get on YouTube and find uh, you know yeah. uh, solutions for a lot of the stuff. Even you know the other day I was looking up uh, an install for like a Magora clutch lever, and I was able to find someone else that actually showed the exact model, the exact bike step for step, and I was like, well, this is great. Like this beats any instruction manual that I could ever hope for. So um, it was yeah. uh, it was fascinating. And again, I think what I liked about this one from Sean F is it does give a real tip of the cap, not just to high side, low side, but to Ari yes. Henning's The Shop Manual. And if you guys aren't familiar, Ari Henning is doing just wildly exciting stuff for those of you, you know, weekend wrenching aficionados mm -hmm. at home in your garage. And then we also have, speaking of weekend wrenching, uh, speaking of YouTubers, uh, Patrick Garvin. Our, our little buddy Indeed. who uh, is working his little tail off over on JP Cycles YouTube channel, and he's doing all kinds of crazy stuff for a lot of the folks out there in the cruiser segment. So, again, thank you to Sean F. Let's move on. Make sure Sean send us an email to highsidelowside at revzilla.com and claim your t shirt. So, tell us what size you want and where to send it specifically. Yeah, yeah. We need an address what? and a size. What's first in the news, Spurge? So we're going to keep doing this until it, it, it shows up, but Get On Adventure Fest is coming yes. to the Mojave Desert in California. Uh, we kicked off our first Get On Adventure Fest last year in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Uh, we are going back to the Black Hills in July, but first and foremost, on April 21st, we are partnering with Rawhide Adventures Training Camp um, at their Zakar facility and we are going to have some fun out in the Mojave Desert. So there's going to be demo rides from BMW, HD, Aprilia, Moto Guzzi. Uh, no notably, if if you have wanted to try the new Touring 660, um, it sounds like Aprilia is going to be there. We've got tons of trails from beginners to experts. Um, and if you want to ride with Zach and I, just head over to revzilla.com slash fest, and you can buy your ticket. Tickets are limited. This is a, this is a limited ticket event. So oh, get them before oh. they sell out. Yeah, a lot of, <laughs> lot of demand right there. So it's gonna be um, it's gonna be fun though. That's, oh yeah, uh, that, 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 that's the bottom line here. Gonna go ride around and 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 have fun. So if you're in the area or if you think you could make your way to the area of Southern California, uh, keep it in mind. It's gonna be a blast. Yeah, the one in the Black Hills was probably one of the the most fun events that I have done in a while uh, last year. Just the riding up there, and then I've I've done riding in the Mojave in this area, and and there's a lot of great trails out there. So looking forward to it. Um, and then moving right along, Zach, what is news topic number two? That, my friend, is a fantastic question. Uh, this is exciting, actually. I think this is a cool news item um, brought to us by our friend Spencer Robert, who spotted the announcement of this E Explore FIM World Cup. I hope I'm saying it right. It's capital E hyphen Explorer 
So I think it's e explorer. That's the way I, I think you're. I think Ax-plorer. you're explorer. Yeah, I, I think that's <laughs> reasonable. I think that's a reasonable assumption based on the way this is spelled. The reason that it is spelled all funky like is the emphasis on the e. Um, so this is an electric <laughs> off road series, as far as I understand it. Uh, it's kind of cool. It's basically. Um, uh, I don't know if it's an invitation or if, or if people like sign up or apply or something. I'm not exactly sure how it works, but uh, it's it's. 10 teams of two riders, one male, one female on each team. So 20 riders um, on, on 10 different teams. And, uh, and it's sort of like all-terrain electric racing. Like if you know what tennis mixed doubles is, right? It's like a, a, a man and a woman on each team, and they play against another man and a woman, which is it's kind of a fun... Uh, where are you, where are you going this with year. this? Uh, only, only to say, <laughs> only to just try and use an analogy to help people understand <laughs> that like... It's it's a mixed uh, it's it's co-ed uh, electric motorcycle racing, um, and it starts in Q3 of 2022, and it seems like uh, kind of a cool uh, I don't know it's like relay race style thing. They'll have like um, some built obstacles like wall rides and stuff like that, but also some natural stuff like just cutting through the woods, um, and it seems like kind of a nifty uh, nifty thing. And apropos off road competition spectacles, which we will be talking about today with Brandon Wise. Yeah, I think it's like it ties into the future of everything that we'll be discussing today. And also, for what it's worth, joking aside, I liked your tennis analogy. Um, <laughs> but the E Explorer FIM World Cup um, takes us right into the next topic. Uh, if you remember a few episodes ago, we were talking about the Stark Varg, which I think is Swedish for uh, hungry wolf. For- Big, Varg Stark. Hungry, hungry wolf. Hungry, hungry, like a wolf. Um, but <laughs> since we had that original announcement a few episodes back, uh, Stark has announced that they have sold 1,000 Vargs in under 24 hours when it was announced. Now, to be clear, these bikes have <laughs> not been produced. What they are doing is they are, they are selling uh, the right to get one of these bikes once they are produced. Um but again, they're claiming shipping to be between 13 to 14 months out of a finalized product. And to quote them, they're saying we're going to make it. We're going to make our calendars work. Like we're going to hit. We're going to hit this deadline. So Zach, <laughs> any thoughts here? Well, so the reason we brought this up is that they sold Stark announced this bike, and everyone's like, "Oh my God, it's an 80 horsepower electric dirt bike, 698 so cool. oh foot pounds or something crazy of torque." Whatever. Just amazing. The point is, it's an it's like this nifty bike that everyone's super hot to trot for, and they took orders and they sold a thousand of them at 15 grand each, and they're saying we're going to deliver them in spring of 2023. So, if it's true, this is awesome. A uh, uh, round of applause for uh, Stark and their Varg. But the re- we are, uh, uh, I think, rightly so, a little skeptical of this kind of thing in general, of, of the sort of like, we're going to sell a whole bunch of, That's you know, $15 million. I just, right, I just used hit. some calculator math there. That's- <laughs> so we, we're just, we're, we, we were marking the calendars to say, next year, we're going to bring this up again. And if everyone's gotten their Stark Varg, then bully for everybody. And if there's a controversy swirling around this company about how they sold $15 million worth of bikes and then didn't deliver any of them, we're going to say, I told you so. That's all. All right. So seems like a cool bike. We're very excited, but we got, we got our eye. So on marking, Stark. marking the calendars, let's just give them the benefit of 14 months from when this <laughs> is being recorded. We'd be looking at somewhere yeah. around, let's just say May 1st, right? We need the strong wolves to be delivered <laughs> by May 1st. So keep that in mind. All 1,000. I'm, I'm making a note. I'm going to put it on my calendar, uh, May 1st of 2023. I'm going to call Zach. Uh, <laughs> we're going to we're going to call all of you individual owners. We're going to call 1,000 people, mm-hmm. and uh, we'll do it. That's, maybe that's what we'll do for the podcast. We'll just have a podcast where we call all 1,000 people and make sure that they get theirs. doesn't sound right. feasible. sounds like that would probably maybe. be very hard for our producer, Chase, to be able to <laughs> accomplish. Come to think of it, they might have the company might have said that it is planning to – like start shipping them then or something, whatever. I don't know. The point is, you're on notice. Uh, yeah, companies yeah, yeah. That- Zach Quartz and Spurgeon Dumbo are keeping their eye on you, Stark. Yeah, you should really be right. shaking in your boots. Motorcycle manufacturer, police. <laughs> the watchful the eye. So the last item of news here um, is actually speaking of announcements that didn't come through. Uh, <laughs> the AMA has announced an esports national championship. This is the second um, time they announced this, isn't it? 
Exactly. It's yeah. the second time they've said, like, we're going to do an eSports thing. So imagine, I don't know, those of you who are MotoGP fans know that uh, there's a there's an e-racing league that, that is adjacent to the actual MotoGP World Championship, and um, video gamers can sign up and compete and win actual uh, actual prizes and actual maybe money or actual trophies anyway. I, uh, so, and they do the same thing in formula one, I believe, uh, and maybe in, uh, in big soccer tournaments. So esports is a thing that's, that's becoming certainly, uh, has become very pervasive and, uh, and popular, I should say, uh, that's a better word for it. And, um, the, uh, uh, the domestic racing series in the United States is looking to take advantage of that, which I think makes sense. Um, uh, just hope that it takes off actually. Well, it's interesting. Like, I think part of the, part of the questions that we had around this was like, yes, I think that from the standpoint of getting people interested in motorcycle racing or motorcycles in general, um, because the winner of this competition is going to get to go and actually spend some time at different actual physical motorcycle racing competitions as part of the prize. Uh-huh. Uh, right. But I, I think one of the things that you know Zach and I were talking about was the example came up of Twenty Four Hour of Le Mans, Le Mans, and uh, they were talking about the fact that. They were doing a, an esports race in conjunction with the actual race, and the winners of right. the esports race got to stand on the podium as well as the winners of the actual race. And I think that's probably a step too far, um, <laughs> in my personal opinion. But from a spectator standpoint, um, you know, I was reading the numbers on some of the the current esports uh, watching uh, statistics from the motorcycling racing that's going on. It's like. 12 million people are tuning in to watch some of this stuff. Like it's, it's incredible numbers. That's, that's a lot more than I think are showing up down in uh, MotoGP in Austin to, you know, watch in person. So (laughs) certainly. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, hopefully there's, uh, there's something going on with that. And I think uh, we do have a note in, in, uh, in our doc here that says, hopefully there'll be an article by the time this, this uh, podcast is live and you are listening to this, there should be an article on common tread it's out. Uh, at revzilla.com it's already out there baby if you want to, if you want to go and read this article it is up and out and it is just comments galore and what was actually interesting to me is that the comments on this article so far have been pretty evenly split uh, I, I was expecting you know <laughs> more people to be upset about this and you know say hey that's not racing um, you know you can't just sit behind a, a, a keyboard and have that count as athleticism right right but people seem very open to it and I think it's definitely uh, a sign of the times as far as like people being yeah. excited about this yeah well that's uh, that's that's it's encouraging and I think when we talked we talked about this briefly with our colleague uh, Jen Dunstan and she said, you know, she made the point that um, that this is a good way to connect with. You know, it might seem silly, especially if you're a crusty old motorcyclist who's been around since before there were video games. You might be thinking, are "You kidding me? They're gonna people are gonna race video game things. They're gonna give them real trophies and call them athletes. What a joke!" And you know, fine. It, that, that's I don't I don't think you're wrong, <laughs> but I do think that uh, first of all, as someone who plays racing video games, I think they're fun, um, and uh, and also I think it's a way to for motorcycling to connect to a different audience, you know, um, they're always trying to get people interested in, in riding. And if it takes, um, you know, being a part of an esports championship to be sort of like, Oh, that's like, this stuff is cool. And, and it's actually, maybe it's more accessible than I thought. Then hopefully that's the case. Well, right? then I have a follow-up question for you because I am so. I think the last uh, motorcycle video game I played was on my Nintendo <laughs> Entertainment System, and it was Excite Bike. <laughs> uh, and I was a huge. I still have. I have one of those Nintendo Entertainment emulators, and I play Excite Bike every now and then, still to this day. But I've never really nice. gone past that, aside from mm. Road Rash Two on Sega Genesis. Nice. So <laughs> actually, if I'm thinking about like the the culmination of what I thought was great for a motorcycle video game, it was like whipping a chain around trying to rip somebody else off of a sport bike. But my right, question right. for you, Zach, is that it's sounds like you've stayed up with um, some of the games uh, that are current, and honestly, the graphics blew my mind. I was watching some of the videos associated with this article, and it's unbelievable how lifelike this stuff is. Are you yeah. planning on competing? Are you going to virtually race? <laughs> no. No, I mean, I've, I've, I have, like, I've, I've dabbled with, like, racing uh, online, you know, with, like, other people online and, you know, sort of, like, you know, comparing my times on leaderboards, uh, global leaderboards and that kind of thing. But I'm not, I'm not very good at it. I'm sort of like, I'm usually kind of like, I don't know, 90th percentile or something like that. Um, so it's like, I'm, I'm above average, but the people that are actually good at it are so much better at it. So <laughs> are you, are you better at racing real motorcycles or are you yes. better? You are. Yes. So I think so. So do you think, do I'm you not, think that's, do you think on, that's the on. average? You think that you think that you are someone that probably <laughs> 
the, the average person racing video games, do you think yeah. they could compete on the same level as you on an actual motorcycle? I do not. Okay. <laughs> I think that if I were at a uh, if I were at some sort of international competition with like you know a hundred um, average video game players. I don't think I would really stand out of the crowd. I think if I were at an international competition with 100 average motorcyclists and we were going on a racetrack, I probably would would rise to Crush the top. them. That's my guess. With an um, iron fist. I, I, I like to think so anyway. I don't know. Um, but I'm not. I, I Perhaps I'm, uh, I'm overselling my actual skills or underselling my video game skills. I don't well, know. what I will say I is we that talk about something else this episode is, is not about <laughs> participation. This episode is about spectatoration. That's a word that I just made up. Um, so we're talking about spectating motorcycle events. We're talking about off-road. And to do that, we need to bring Brandon Wise onto the program. So let's get him Let's get him on here. Let's do it. There he is, Brandon Wise. How's it going, man? Howdy. You look great. Do you feel great? Oh, I am feeling really great. Howdy doody, guys. <laughs> How's it going? So we were just talking about... Um, uh, get on Adventure oh. Fest in Mojave. Yeah. You are one of the one of the Revzilla hosts that will be attending and riding around in the desert with everyone. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I'm pretty excited about it. <laughs> last year was pretty good yeah. out in South Dakota. Right. So, yeah. Brandon yes, Brandon indeed. showed up last year on a Ducati Scrambler street version and <laughs> proceeded to like just blow the doors off of all of these like hardcore ADV guys there on their like thirty thousand dollar outfits and Brandon's like I got this bike for free and I uh, smashed the uh, the oil filter off but it's okay it Literally just keeps running first day and and yeah. Patrick you know it was Patrick's bike and he was like just be careful the you know it's a low hanging oil filter and I was like yeah okay cool and I smashed it literally the first day I was like Sweet, cool. <laughs> well we, we were we were doing we were doing uh, jump photos and finally yeah. Brandon's like I think I need to stop jumping this bike because like the oil filter had completely squashed um, and yeah. it was so Brandon mentioned Patrick it's pa again Patrick Garvin our, our little cohort out in uh, South Dakota it was nice enough to let Brandon use the bike yeah. and we we definitely owed him a oil filter after that yes I sent him oil filter and oil and a bottle of whiskey <laughs> we should probably buy him a skid so, we actually should probably buy him a skid plate for that bike yeah, would be more appropriate that, yeah. do you guys true. know where you might be able to find aftermarket parts for a motorcycle like where would you would you get them online or, I'm baffled or, I I mean if only there was an online place that would just send them to your mm. front door it would make it yeah, so yeah. much easier okay. I think it's well if we come up with an official <laughs> yeah right if we come up with an official recommendation for you guys on that, we'll let you know. But for now, who knows? Um, on the topic of Brandon's past motorcycling experiences, Brandon, what we do a lot of times the first time we have a, a co-host um, on the program uh, is to do a quick lightning round. Oh, boy. So people get a little background and they know a little bit more about you and, yeah. and maybe okay. we'll learn something too. Okay. So we're going to jump right into these. So you can do, it'll be quick, quick, uh, quick questions, quick answers. Um We'll blast right through these, and then we'll so jump the whole into podcast the, can't just be this. I can't just no, no. About the, the audience, okay, okay. no, it audience doesn't care be. about. Good to no, know. Good no, to know. No, yeah, stop yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> so, question number one, Brandon Wise, um, how did you get into motorcycling, and what was your first bike? Oh, great question. Um, so, I was a young kid. I grew up around like Fayette, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Always saw all bikes on the road. It was just I just thought they were so cool. I remember being in a car as a kid and just seeing a guy lift up the front end and just blow by our car. And I was immediately hooked. Oh, did a wheelie? Yeah, yeah. And, and oh. I was a kid sitting in the car, and I'm just like, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. You know, so that and really— And what did your, what did your parents say oh, when that happened? I mean— Were they like— No, I, don't, I have no idea. I was just so just like glued <laughs> okay. to the All window, right. just staring at him, you know. So that kind of hooked me initially. Um, but they I were driving him on his way to Sunday school, and then this is just you know this <laughs> right, is how it ends. Exactly. Right. But uh, yeah, and, and that kind of hooked me there. My parents wouldn't let me get a bike when I was a kid because mm -hmm. I was playing a lot of sports, and you know my right. parents have had family members get hurt on bikes, and they're dangerous, yada yada. So I understand that. But my first bike, um, I got that when I was seventeen. Um, it was a Suzuki GS 500 E. I think it was a 93 yeah. or 96, something like that. Just like a little naked sport bike from Suzuki. Sure. Yep. Little yeah. parallel twin, right? Yeah. And that thing was bulletproof. Like we could not <laughs> kill it. Flipped it into ravines, took it downstairs, like never changed the oil for like three years. Like would not die. So, so essentially the oh, same right way on. that you That's treat cool. your motorcycles today too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Blew yeah. up a 300 XCW engine. Yeah. I'm, I'm really good when I play mechanics. So. Right, right. All right, cool. Yeah, that's that's a good, that's a great first bike. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. 
and uh, yeah, right on. All, All right. right. So, moving, question, yeah, so moving straight along, um, you know, Brandon and I have, have both been at Revzilla for a while, and I know most of you sorted past Brandon, but, you know, really, how did, <laughs> how did you get started with Revzilla? How long have you been here, and, and, and what was your impetus for, uh, for joining the company? Oh, man. Uh, so... I was moving up here from North Carolina with a girl that I was dating at the time. Um, didn't really know much about Revzilla or Philadelphia. I remember watching a video of Anthony talking about a helmet that I, I ended up buying, but from somewhere else because it was cheaper. I don't know if I should say that. But <laughs> oh my God. It was. I know. I'm already <laughs> throwing us under the bus. That's really great. Uh, but yeah, I've, uh, and my buddy worked here actually. He's the one who told me about this place. It, uh, Miles, he worked in CS for about six months and ended up going back to North Carolina. But he's like, dude, if you're moving up there, you got to check out this place. So I ended up hopping on my bike. I drove up here from North Carolina on my old ZRX and kind of scoped it out. I was like, hell yeah, I, I got I to gotta get it uh, into this place. So I started in CS as a gear geek about two weeks before you did, Spurgeon. But uh, our careers just, you know, yours just really zoomed off there right out of the gate. <laughs> Yeah, so. it's it's yeah, really real 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 skyrocket <laughs> yeah. trajectory here. So what we're we're a little over eight years now, right? Uh, between yeah, it'll both. be nine. It'll be nine years, nine years this year. Nine in years. Of I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know you'd been at Revzilla that long, Brandon. That's cool. Too long, man. Yeah. Too long. Yeah. <laughs> Too long. <laughs> or kidding. not long enough. Honestly, yeah, on, uh, no. It, which it's, executives are listening? It's genuinely been a blast. Like, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go down that road because you know. One of us will start crying or something. I don't know. All right. No, well, it's definitely no. It's definitely been it's been a wild and crazy ride. We could probably yeah, actually sure. do an entire podcast episode on like you know <laughs> the history of Revzilla over oh, the past yeah. decade. Um, but no, that's that's awesome. And Brandon, like I said, it's 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 good to see you know the fact that I think one of the the cool things about Revzilla is the evolution. So many people that started here yeah. eight, nine, ten years ago, um, and especially in the CS side of things, you know, a lot of us started in customer service, and it just kind of has grown into. Um, yeah. A nice way to move in different directions. So just trying to get our foot in the door, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And yeah, I learned a right. lot over there. I mean, you're learning new stuff constantly in the you know on the CS team. So yeah, that's pretty cool. word. Well, um, more to the point of your personal history, Brandon Wise. Um, yes, what talk us through what motorcycles are in your garage now, and mm -hmm. what your favorite one is. Okay, so in the garage now, I've got a 1999 Kawasaki KE 100. Super, super fun. Nice. Recently rode that in the snow, and it was <laughs> really sketchy. I've got a uh, 2005 Vespa LX150. That's actually here in the office. It's leaking oil. I need to put a new gasket on it. Um, yeah, you got knobby tires 20, on that bad boy. Oh, I've taken it to the it's pines. It's dirt it's, machine. It does yeah. great. It does great. And then I've got a 2021 KTM 250 XCF um, and a 2013 Triumph Thruxton 900. My favorite right, is is yeah. definitely going to be KTM. I mean, I know I don't think we can do a high side low side podcast without talking about KTM legally. Nope, I think can't. there's a, some contract drink, yep. to be signed there's, somewhere. Uh, yep, but, yep, uh, exactly. Yeah, that one's probably my favorite just because I love dirt bikes. Right. So yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. good answer. Yeah. I like it. I like, I like it. So closing closing out the lightning round of getting to know Brandon. For those of you <laughs> listening, um, you know we're trying to paint you a, a nice holistic picture of who this young Southern sweet draw of a gentleman <laughs> is. Um, if you're listening, he's he, his voice matches his his good looks and charm. Uh, oh Brandon, most memorable moto moment. So in your Ooh. in your you know you, you're probably what like 19, 20 years old now. Um, <laughs> you've got those those young. Boyish good looks, but in your oh, in your boy. your long history as a motorcyclist, probably over the last you know fifteen years or so, twenty years or so, um, what's your most memorable motorcycle moment? Man, that is a really great question. Um, I'd have to say, even though I'm you know an avid dirt rider right now, I love you know racing hair scrambles and enduros and things like that. I think the first time I dragged my knee around the track on an R6 was oh. just like. Nice. Dude, it's just one of those moments where I was literally doing 90 around a bull turn. It was just the coolest feeling ever. I will never, yeah. ever forget that. And I have photo proof of that very moment, which is really awesome. You so, got you have a photo of dude, the first time? I have a photo of the very first time. And wow. shortly after that photo was taken, it was like a millisecond. I like yanked my knee up because it actually scared me. I was like, whoa. Oh, yeah. You know, like, sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, you don't you don't forget your first time. Dude. As they say. <laughs> um well that's uh that's that's good that's a good constellation of memories you you've you've compiled there brandon and uh and i feel like it's a uh, good show, shows the diversity in your, your background the t types of bikes you like to ride that kind of thing so hopefully yeah. uh you folks out there in podcast land have got um 
a good idea. Yeah, of don't don't let all where this fool from. you. I'm a goon, fool and fool. So I'm, I'm just a <laughs> weirdo. Right on, right on. Yeah. Well, let's, right. let's move um, on because Brandon's favorite, one of his favorite bikes right now is KTM, which I think <laughs> does move right into what we are talking about in the oh, podcast yeah. today, um, which is uh, motorcycle racing of the off-road persuasion and, uh, you know, really kind of what it's like to be a, a spectator for this and, you know, for people that are listening, what they can expect from, you know, watching it, maybe a little bit of history around it and, you know, right. kind of breaking down what some of these different, you know, types of racing are because i think for a lot of people out there you hear supercross or motocross you're like oh that's the same thing uh or mm. enduro racing or you know gncc's right. and oh that's the same thing and, and they're really right. not so i think we're going to hopefully educate and entertain a little bit today which is really oh, what yes. we're trying to do here so yeah. um so for background the reason we came up with this idea was our uh, our friend we've mentioned a few times now patrick garvin wrote mm-hmm. an article which i think maybe you contributed to is that right i Brandon? did i sure did Yeah. okay yep. so the article was about um how uh, a couple of riders got injured in the first round of Supercross in 2022 uh, at Anaheim. Is that right? And what was Ken Roxon and someone else? Is that right? Um, I don't, I don't think Ken Roxon got injured. I think. Oh, he got his head got run over. Yeah, right? that was like somehow. some. Right. Yeah, one of the races. I think that might have been last <laughs> right. week or whatever. Yeah, but right, a lot right. of injuries so, in the whoops. Is what right, right about. in the whoops. Yeah. So, so Patrick's article uh, was about is. Are the are the is the whoop section in this track too difficult? And are people just trying to like bail through it too fast? Mm-hmm. And is it like is it is it detracting from the spectacle of watching Supercross because it's sort of like is this willy nilly like thing that like riders might get through or they might not and they're just kind of throwing themselves in there and are are we are we missing something like should, w- yeah. would it be better if it wasn't quite as gnarly or would it be better if you know or or should it be difficult because these are pro riders and and sort of this guy's thinking like interesting what you know what is what is what are the things that we like about watching certain types of of um of dirt bike of off road motorcycle competition and what has sort of like shaped our our lives as motorcycle spectators so i think we're, we're not talking about necessarily the history of every single right. <laughs> off-road motorcycle sport here today it's more like we're talking about where you can watch them how they're different and how they turned into what they are to a certain extent and so there'd be a little bit of talk i think about that'll seem a little bit rudimentary if you're very involved with motorcycles um but hopefully if you're not it'll help you out a little bit and then on the flip side of things we'll probably get into the, de- the nitty-gritty just a little bit on certain series yeah so that's what that's what you can expect and i think it's an interesting question about the whole whoops thing like. yeah it really is and you know that ties directly into supercross of course and if you're not familiar with supercross the racing if you haven't been watching it this year is incredible i mean it's you know we've got mm-hmm. different riders on different manufacturer bikes which changes the game a little bit everybody's you know fine-tuning their machine but supercross right let you know should we just cover the basics real quick kind of get yeah, into yeah, it? yeah. Cool. talk yeah. through the difference between supercross yeah, and yeah, motocross yeah. for example so supercross you know that is in an arena setting it's like going to a big monster truck rally basically right you're like in the arena you've got fireworks you've got flames thrown everywhere you're you're in a stadium setting so you can see the whole track from pretty much everywhere in the entire stadium which is really really cool i love that aspect of it just getting that view of everything and you've got everything on the big screens if you're not super close to one particular section motocross though is outdoors right the tracks are a little bit longer there's a ton of elevation it's not as you know tight quarter close quarter racing like supercross is so it's a very different animal i would say it's you know the same racers doing both series but right, they are right. different animals for sure and that's and that's something that can be a little bit confusing for yeah, people is yeah, that yeah. the same riders usually or mm-hmm. often most of the same riders take part in supercross and in motocross because right. the discipline as far as like riding the bike and, and going over the jumps is very similar it's just one takes place in a baseball or football stadium and one takes place in an outdoor and a natural exactly. environment yep. yeah right. and from the, from the standpoint of which one came first uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh basically this is where i think starting with motocross makes the most sense because motocross you could trace back to like the international six days enduro or international six days trials which was back in yeah. england and i think in like 1913 and then yeah, all over s- europe uh, well, it's. It, I believe it's. Oh, the started, original one. You I mean. believe it started. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yep. And then okay. it. And yeah, and then it was all over Europe. But I think you know that's where a lot of a, a lot of this racing off road comes from. It was you know historically uh, a, a very European type racing. I think in America you had board you had board track racing, which became uh, eventually American flat track in the World War II, post World War II era, somewhere around there. Um, but when you look at what motocross was, it it really was what developed into what we think of 
as you know off road racing today. And then it was I th- I want to say like 1974 was Supercross was like yeah. like Supercross yeah. became so, like the the finale of like let's move this indoors and have a big finale yeah. for the series. Yeah, they all thought yeah, it was in the mid bad idea. They're like this isn't, and then it kind of took off, you know. And so much yeah. stuff has spun off of you know motocross since then, which is pretty cool. So well, I would imagine yeah, too so, if you think about the fact that like in the seventies they were they were still using two stroke motorcycles and like <laughs> yeah. could you imagine being stuck in a stadium S- smelling all that? Yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> just just carbon dioxide poisoning to the max there. Well, back people were probably smoking too. So yeah. it was like, <laughs> we're smoking cigars and cigarettes, and then there were two strokes everywhere. It's, like, so the, it's all those oh, Camel and Marlboro point. sponsorships. Yeah, they, yeah, have yeah. To, they have exactly. to live up to it. Um, so, quick question. Um, mm. That's a that's a, a fair point about the history of it, Spurge. I think that's a good thing to bring up, and how you know, and how Supercross respond from motocross, and now it's its own thing. Um, one event that I have been to, just for a quick clarification, uh, is called Arena Cross. Oh, yeah. Which is also in an arena. Yes. As and the name implies. <laughs> as the name implies. And but it is not supercross. So arena arena cross is basically what is that? Is ba- that's basically like the junior varsity <laughs> supercross. Is that kind of what it is? Um yeah, I mean yeah. Do they still do arena cross? They do. They absolutely do. Okay. And and a lot of amateurs uh can do that. You can see that a lot of local areas there's arena cross. But it's got like rocks and logs and there's a little bit more of an obstacle aspect to that. It, oh really? In addition to um, you know, having jumps and things like that as well. So, so it's a little more of like enduro. Is it, what's enduro cross then? Yeah, it's kind of like enduro cross, right? That's what I think of at least. Oh, okay. So, so let's hold on a second because okay. I, I want to <laughs> let's let's focus on supercross motocross before we get sure, to the sure. enduro side of things, right? Yeah. Okay. Fair. So yeah, fair. I I want to I want to put on my history teacher cap for a second. Uh oh. Here we go. Uh, I'm gonna get a little bit nerdy here. Uh oh. Uh, nice. So I was doing some research for this, and it was fun. It was fun to go back and look at like where the shift was in America, right? Because, um, again, like we said earlier, a lot of this really did start in Europe. And I would, I think you could argue by today's standards, if you were looking at something like the International Six Days Enduro, that almost might be more like a rally event, which we'll talk a lot about a little bit later, versus yep. like a, a one-day, you know, three-hour yeah. competition. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, the shift in America came in around 1966, and there was a gentleman by the name of Edison Dye, and he was trying to import these European bikes. At the time, uh, America, uh, our American riders really were still using four strokes. They were using British bikes that were converted over. And what Edison did was he created a partnership with Husqvarna. And originally, Husqvarna wanted nothing to do with him. They're like, listen, motorcycling is never going to be a thing in the U.S. We don't see it as a viable market. We don't want to send you bikes. And he spent two years persuading them to import uh, a, a 400 cross country, which was at the time this revolutionary two-stroke light dirt bike compared to what Americans were riding, um, which were basically modified British twins. And he brought a bike over, talked Malcolm Smith into riding one. Malcolm Smith said, all right, listen, guys, I'll take this out for a quick ride up in the mountains and I'll let you know if it's any good. Malcolm Smith comes back and he's like, I I think I like this. Can I use it in my race this coming weekend? And Edison Dye goes, absolutely. Take it and, and ride it. Malcolm Smith finished 20 minutes faster than anybody else in this in this local <laughs> desert race in Southern California. Yahtzee. And so Edison uh, goes back to Husqvarna and says, I'll take I'll take 50. Send them over. I want them air freighted. I want them here in time for the race season to start. I'm going to start selling these things. And as soon as Malcolm Smith won that race, it just it blew up. And I think really from that point on in 1966, the big shift was you now have motorcycle manufacturers specifically making bikes that are better for dirt and off-road riding. Where up until that right. point, really, it was like, how do I take my motorcycle yeah, and modify everyone's it? Everyone's modifying it, right. right. So I think I think that's a, I think that year of 1966 is a really pivotal year to hit home for people because that was where I would say the start of modern off-road riding really could be argued was was the beginning there. Well, yeah. Spurgeon, yeah, you enough. clearly know a lot more about that than I do. I was expecting <laughs> you to pull out a pie chart or something like that. <laughs> that got exciting. So no, but I but I would say that like for me, like I like the historical story, and I know that you know for for Brandon, and one of the reasons that we really wanted to have Brandon on here um, is that Brandon follows it 
more modern day. Like if you asked me who is lining up on the grid this this coming weekend, <laughs> I could I could I could take a couple lucky stabs in the dark, but I wouldn't I wouldn't understand I wouldn't I wouldn't know yeah. that off the top of my head. Um, where and I think that's where Brandon, you probably you know yeah kind of come for into sure. Play. I, I'm watching so, it every weekend and know every writer and follow him on Instagram all that jazz. So so for the people who didn't read the common trade article, shame shame on you. <laughs> but if they didn't read the common trade article, um. What is your take on that whole situation, uh, Brandon, that, sure. that sort of sparked this whole conversation? Like, the, the, So, okay, first of all, mm-hmm. describe what whoops mean, oh, like yeah. what, what a, what a whoop-de-do section is, <laughs> and, then, um, and, then, and then talk about what, yeah. you know, so, the, the root of that. So are. the whoop sections are like, they're just like these deep craters in the ground, basically, and there's like a roll, they're like hills, right? But they're kind of evenly spaced, but they're super, super deep, and you cannot fully appreciate how deep these things are and how gnarly they actually are until you actually get on those tracks and walk it from your TV. It's like, why is that guy fumbling around just going over these little Hills? Like what's going on? But it's really intense. Like it's, it's serious. Right. So, um, and, and to just to, just sure. to back up a little bit, it's, it's like a, it's a section, it's a straight section yeah. of track mm-hmm. where there are uh, like, a uh, rolling uh, Hills, lateral have- undulations. Yeah, 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 exactly. And sort of like, and you can imagine if if a like washboard on a road were to be right. huge, That's it would be kind of like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and <laughs> and if it and if it and if they're kind of shallow, if they're only like a foot deep or something like that, well, you can like skim over the top yep. of those pretty fast. But at a pro level and at Supercross, they make them really massive and deep and steep and yeah. and kind of gnarly. But the guys still just skim across the top of them. Yeah, right? some of them can blitz them so easily. And these are the top athletes, right? Like they're the right. greatest riders at this type of riding. And so many of them are getting injured in there and just, it, it kind of doesn't break both their arms and not be able to race the rest of the, you know, made one little bobble in the whoop section. So some people are like, you know, that's the whoops. That's what's exciting about them. You know, the carnage. So to each their own. So what's your, what, what, what do you think though? Like, like if you had to say like, is it too dangerous? Is this something that's a problem? What would you say? Or like too hard, you know, like, is it too difficult? Is it making it so difficult for the riders that, that it's just like a crapshoot in a lottery yeah. rather than skill to do it? I, I just hate thinking about one small section having so much power determining a racer's, you know, long term in okay. the racing season. So I I don't know. I'm I'm kinda like right there in the middle where I like the carnage a lot of the time, you know. There's that other side of me. I like love seeing people <laughs> get scrappy out there, but the other part of me is like, Oh man, this is just like it's just too much. It's just like it's bad. So, so I you, think I'm I'm right there in the fence. I, I think the I think one of the things that I thought interesting about this was, and this goes back to the historical aspect, like mm-hmm. motorcycle r- racing now, the, the courses are arguably bigger and crazier. When we're looking at specifically Supercross and Motocross, the courses, the, the jumps are bigger. And keeping in mind, too, when we're talking specifically about Supercross and Motocross, these are man-made tracks, or, or woman-made. These are these are tracks that are made. <laughs> it's You're not out just racing in someone's backyard. Um, so we're building these huge jumps right. we're building the 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 sections deeper and more aggressive when we're getting into the whoops and if if we didn't have motorcycles that could handle it it would be impossible and i think that's something to think about too because there is someone that I was talking to that was like, oh, well, it's so much, it, it's not the same now. When I, back in my day in the 60s, like the bikes were so dangerous. Like it's so much, it's much safer now. There's airbag suits and there's, you know, 14 inches of suspension travel. But arguably, you know, you weren't taking your 1955, you know, Triumph Twin off of a, you know, a triple <laughs> kicker and like launching it 60 75 yeah. feet in the air. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, to... I think actually, Supercross is is easier for me to watch as someone who's not a, a I'm not I'm not like a I'm not I don't follow it super closely, and I think it is easier for me to watch because oh, yeah. it's more understandable. You can see the whole track, and you're mm-hmm. like, okay, like this guy's got to get to that part first, and and it's all very kind of like condensed. Right. Um, but I think when I when I actually mull it over in my head, motocross is more intriguing to me and kind of makes more sense because the the outdoor motocross is uh like the track is Spurgeon's right they do build the jumps and they build the tracks to a certain extent but they're often built into an environment right exactly. like you're having to go like, like on the side of a hill and, and then stuff yeah yeah exactly yeah. it's on the side of a mountain you got to go down a hill and then you got to go up the other side of the hill and then you got to go through a little ravine and um and i think i don't know that kind of like i get this whole stadium thing like sure yeah it makes sense obviously but like 
if you if you're talking about what I don't know, like a a more a more kind of true test of 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 rider and machine versus an environment, it feels like using a natural environment is a yeah. little bit more appealing. And what's fun about motocross is that you know it's not stadium seating, so you can post up at a section and then be like, okay, right. I'm going to go over to that section later, and then I'm going to go over there, and you can see and be really close to a specific area and watch the riders right. and be right there in it, which is really cool. If you want to get some roost to the face, like you can make that happen there. So. Yeah. But I think the down I think the downside of that mm-hmm. is that where Supercross you can you can literally do the bird's eye view thing and watch the whole thing and you know who's in first right. place and you can follow them around. Right. When you get out to motocross, um, mm-hmm. it, it's much more like other forms of racing where like all you're really all you're really spectating is one corner. So I think that kind of gets or, into you know or or a few corners at least like you yeah. can see yeah. depending on you the can track. see like yeah. a little yeah. bit of the track. It depends on sure. the track. But yeah, yeah, you have to see a section and then and then they're going to disappear and they're going to go somewhere else. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's much longer. Yeah. But I guess my question is, is that if you're if you're watching this, let's say someone someone that's listening has never watched Supercross, they've never watched motocross, uh, they're they're learning all about this for the first time. Which is more easy? Which is easier to watch if you're just tuning in on television at home? Sure, I, I would definitely say. Well, if you're tuning in on television at home, they do a great job for both motocross and Supercross. So I think both of right. they are kind of even playing field when it comes to watching them on TV. Um, but in person, I think if you're new to it, Supercross would probably be a little bit more exciting. You can see the whole track, so you'd probably, right. you know, it yep. had the advantage there in person. So yeah, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think, I think that that's probably true. I will say the the one caveat I'll add there is that having been to Supercross and to motocross races in mm-hmm. person, motocross is cool because you can get closer to yeah, you sometimes exactly. get closer to the action and you can really kind of like if you're into watching people control a motorcycle it's cool because you can watch as Spurgeon pointed out before you can only really see usually one section or one or two sections of the track you're not the whole thing like you can in supercross but with outdoor motocross you can get close enough that you can really kind of see oh yeah how the riders body are doing language things. and how different each rider takes a particular yeah. corner and yeah and and you can see you have a you'll have a real appreciation for for the environment also you know you'd be standing on the side of a hill and you'll be thinking like man it was hard to walk up this hill or to walk <laughs> right. down this hill. you know and then these dudes will just like boost down it um and it's it's kind of like uh i thought that be, you know seeing outdoor motocross live and standing next to those jumps as, as they go off them was like really in some ways it was more special on a micro level um than seeing supercross oh, yeah. live where you're you're in like row you know, ZF and you're just kind of like, okay, cool. You know, like I'm 50 yards from the track here. Um, and like, I can see what's going on and it's fun to watch, but dude, but it's, yeah, it's not, not, I would say, too, I mean, that, that guy, like, how do you want to experience your motorcycle racing, right? right? Yeah, like, if you want like absolutely. a day outside, you want to be outside in the fresh air and like, you want to like, kind of have like, an all day <laughs> yeah. thing where you can walk around and do some hiking. Or like, do you want to go to a baseball stadium and <laughs> right. park in a parking yeah. lot and Eat walk your hot dog <laughs> yeah, and totally. drink your beers? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's a yeah, good point. Right on. And where do you, um, you, the NBC has a contract for Supercross, right? The, is yeah. it also outdoor motocross? Is it on NBC or Peacock or something like that? I, I know Peacock, um, you can watch. You know, you get a little bit more with Peacock as far as Supercross goes. Hulu Live is usually where I watch it, and you get qualifying and the main events. Um, but I don't have Peacock, so I don't know how much more you're getting. <laughs> I'm sure you're just getting like practice and stuff like that. But I just yeah. got yeah. Peacock for free because oh. apparently Grubhub was giving it away for three months. Oh so I, I just, more. I just watched, I just watched Supercross <laughs> the other day uh, on Peacock uh, for the first nice. time. So what I will say is that. I know that NBC had it, and I, mm-hmm. the only reason I know that NBC was doing motocross too was because I was at my grandmother's house visiting her last <laughs> year, and uh, we were flipping through the channels, and there was a motocross race, and I was like, well, let's just watch this. I'll show you kind of like, you know, when we're out riding dirt bikes, it's kind of like this. And within five minutes, my grandmother was just like, no, I can't. I, if I know that this is something like you're doing, we can't watch this. This is, this is horrible. Why are they doing this? Yeah, and she was funny. like visibly upset. So we had to turn it. Nana got, Nana got Nana. too uh, excited with motocross. Across, so we had to turn it off. That's where I broke well, my leg for the first time at the motocross right? track. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> like you said for the first time. Yeah. Um, so for um, I think I think this is a good segue uh, mm-hmm. to to pivot to another kind of off road, so different types of off road motorcycle racing that are probably sometimes confused for mm. motocross, um, being uh, uh, like hard enduros or even GNCC. Yeah races so history's te- history teacher spurge do you want to do you want to do you want to take this one or are you are you prepared to speak to the history of this as well you, I know a little you know bit yeah bikes. yeah i think so it really started with um i would say enduro riding is something where you have like timekeeping enduros 
you've got, uh, which is basically like you have one long track and you have to go through different segments and you can't go over a certain speed and you have to reset your clocks. There's then, Brandon, would it be hair scrambles? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So you have hair scrambles, which is more of a... There's a there's a traditional like route, and you have to see how many times you can go around the route yeah, and the uh, in a set time. amount of time. Right, right. Yep. And then you have GNCCs, which are just longer, mm -hmm. right? Those are like and three hours, and like the tracks maybe a little bit longer. Right. And that's uh, and GNCC you, is Grand National Cross Country, is that right? Nailed it. Yep. Yep. Okay. And then you have hard enduros, which is probably more a, a bit more recent. Um, Tennessee Knockout, yes. Red Bull Romaniacs, and that's where they just make it very hard. Yeah. Uh, they, it's it's nearly <laughs> it's impossible. A nightmare. But the and the bikes, so the talk about the difference between the bikes in motocross and supercross, which I know supercross and motocross bikes are they're tuned slightly differently, but largely those are the same bikes. Am I well, right? Well, time out. So what we need to talk like if we're talking about so that's where I would ask Brandon, but sure. when we're going back to supercross, motocross, mm -hmm. those are relatively the same, yeah, right? Th those Isn't two share basically I, the same setups. I mean, they okay. maybe change gearing and stuff like that. Obviously, they're not yeah. like the stock bikes you get off the shelf but yeah between supercross right. and motocross if i'm not mistaken okay. those two are yeah. the same when we <laughs> yeah, go I, into hair scramble gncc stuff like those are different this, animals this is the clarification that i was reaching for sure, i think supercross sure. and motocross are like they are the bikes are tuned differently yeah, yeah, and they're yeah. they're slightly different but in in large part especially from a lay person's yeah, perspective yeah, yeah. they're very similar whereas but in even, GNCC, though, even though they look even though they look the same what i would say is that like these are they're they're 250 and 450 class, right. and they're and, we're, and they're they're four stroke motors now. Correct. And then yep. when we get over to enduro, the biggest change that I'm aware of is the suspension. I mean, obviously gearing and things like that. But when you're looking at the suspension, because motocross bikes do take larger jumps, they've got stiffer suspension mm -hmm. yeah. with more travel, and enduro bikes are typically a little bit less travel, like 11 inches of travel ish. Uh, and it's a little bit softer because you're typically doing right. like rocks and ruts and roots. Yeah, that, that's a good comparison. Yeah, and I think the transmissions are a little bit. A lot of them are more like a wider band transmission. You know, right. I feel like because MX bikes because the clicking. speeds would be the speeds would be a little bit more different. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Or more diverse. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. 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 Fair enough. So and then, from a historical perspective, let's size, just back up to the history. There's a few other things. The, but, yeah. the big the big shift uh, that I remember in America. Um, and again, I, I'm going to get a little bit fuzzy with like the desert racing stuff in Southern California. <laughs> but the the event that I remember reading about that happened, I want to say in West Virginia, was the Blackwater 100. I don't know if anybody remembers this. There was a really good article no, by I Brett, Brett yeah. Smith that he wrote a, an article yeah, about okay. this. But yeah, the Blackwater 100 was, I, I want to say like the the grandfather of what was Enduro and, and GNCC. And it was this event that they ran for many years down in, I want to say again, West Virginia. Um, and it was, you see the pictures of these guys and it was un unbelievable. It was just like a, a course that was incredibly hard and difficult with water crossings. <laughs> and, and when you're talking about Enduro, GNCC, hard Enduro stuff. This is not a groomed track. Uh, this is now you are riding and racing in the environment. Oh, yeah. So you go out into the woods somewhere. There's a single track route cut through. They might build some obstacles. And um, it and gets it's gnarly. It gets so chewed up. Like for hair scrambles, you know, that's my favorite. Sorry to interrupt you, but that's no, my favorite type of racing. And you're doing, you know, this set course for like two hours. But think about, you know, 500 riders however many riders go through that same track you know for a few hours like it gets really gnarly really fast the terrain is, is so wild so one of the one of the, brandon and i did a race together we did a 24-hour race oh, yeah. in in upstate new york it was the national uh it was a national northeast northeast 24-hour yeah. uh enduro, enduro race mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that a typical GNCC is like a three-hour race. Brandon, like you race, Brandon races in the uh, what's the, what's the league that you race in? I'm blanking off. Yeah, the top it's of my head. the ECEA. Is that what you're referencing? ECA. Yeah, yeah. Yep, East Coast Enduro Association, mm -hmm. which is actually a it's a pretty prominent race association right. here in the Northeast. Um, but what what is your typical race uh, like for a hair scramble? It's like two hours. Right at the two-hour marker, you're going as hard as you can. Um, no and, stops. And how many, how many, how many, how many folks are normally lined up with you Ooh. on the course at the same time? Yeah, going for the same corner right off the starting line. It's anywhere from like thirty to forty for my particular class. So it's and then throughout the entire day. Oh gosh, I don't know. I don't know. Couple hundred, yeah, yeah, like hundreds, couple hundred, right? Yeah. yeah, for sure. 
Yeah. So by the if you're if you're the last class going out, like the course is pretty chewed up. Especially I've seen Brandon come back from some muddy races, and it's it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Check but my Instagram. Brandon and I did. <laughs> Brandon and I did one once that was a 24 hour race, and you go in with a team. And it's an 11 mile course, and you just have to see how many laps you can yep. do in 24 hours. And this is thousands of riders, thousands. Yeah. And by the time you get to like the, the like, remember the last time we did it, like a rainstorm came through, it was mud bogs, and like the mud is up to your knees. Like people are trying to fall asleep in the pits for a couple of hours to wake up and go back out again. And it just becomes like at first, like the first couple of laps is easy and it's fun and everybody's having a good time. <laughs> and then by the end of it, it's like, I hate myself. Yeah, why am, why I, am I here? <laughs> exactly. And I think that's just that's probably a, a, a bit of a of a magnified version of what this is. But usually, when you're looking at these these races, it just gets harder as it goes on because, like Brandon said, the course gets really chewed up. Yeah, and with enduros, you got you know you get breaks in there in between and stuff like that. So it's it's a longer day of riding, but there's a little bit more breaks, you know, uh, intertwined. Expl- in it, so. Explain that. So that's that's sure. not a hair. So when we're talking about yeah, yeah. hair scrambles, hair scramble is two to three hours, as many laps as you can do. Explain what a traditional timekeeping yeah. enduro is for us. I'm really bad at the enduro part. Like I just do it because it's <laughs> great trails and riding all day. I usually take the time card and just huck it in the trash and treat it like a long hair scramble. But traditionally you, you know, you, you look at the timesheet they give you, you try to pay attention to your speed through certain sections. There's like a goal that you're trying to hit and you're kind of, you, you pay attention to the clock. You got to do some math and there's just different sections that you check into and you get penalized if you arrive too early. It's actually better to arrive late to a checkpoint than it is to arrive early, which Whoa. I'm like, come on now, what? Like, So that's right. why I like hair scrambles. Brand I just want to go. Yeah, he just can't, he can't slow so, down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, right, right. It's a little but different. They have like, there, but they have, like secret, they have like secret checkpoints yeah, and do. stuff they too, do. right, Brandon? Yep, yeah, absolutely. It's pretty are, interesting. Mm-hmm. Are there, is there a series on a, on a professional level that uses that type of scoring? On a professional level, I think like there's definitely enduros that uh, you know Jarvis and all those kind of guys, Billy Bolt and stuff. I think they have checkpoints as well. I don't know if they get penalized for arriving too early. I don't know if they do that Mm -hmm. type of racing, but um, so there's a lot. There's a lot shifting. There's a lot shifting right now with traditional timekeeping enduros, which are a a thing that's been around for a while. But I think ECEA is now going to be adopting that as well, which is kind of like an enduro as far as like there's sections that you're hitting but you got to hit those you're going through those as quickly as you can and the individual with the lowest time wins kind of like golf or whatever so all right. kinds of different so, off-road racing it's not uh, just if so, you're listening none of this is like golf i can promise you i can no, promise no, 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 you no. that no um so uh i think uh from a from a, when we're talking about spectator sport you know like watching some of this stuff yeah. um this this ties into the conversation I think because the mm-hmm. the this spar- the spurred from the sort of like a supercross whoop section being so difficult that it's potentially tarnishing the sport a little bit or making it like less fun to watch potentially. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people will like disagree, a, but yeah, yeah, right. A lot of people would disagree, and that's totally fine. Right, right, this, right. this is why it's a conversation. <laughs> but the but the the hard enduro uh, championship. There's an FIM World Hard Enduro Championship, right? Right. right. Is that right? Yeah. And that. Um, that includes some some races that people may have heard of or may have seen clips on YouTube or something like, like that. Erzberg, but, Romaniacs, yeah, yeah, that kind of right, stuff. right, right. Um, and that's basically like a it's a time trial. I mean, it's a it's a gate it's a gate drop race, right? Like everybody leaves at the same time, mm-hmm. and you try and get through stuff as fast as you can. Is that right? Pretty much, yeah. And then it's just like whoever gets through it the fastest wins. Yeah, and your class, yeah, and I think right, and yeah, and on. the obstacles are miserable, just right? That's the whole thing with hard enduros is that it's supposed to be. Like what kind of stuff do they have to, like oh, if, if people aren't familiar, what kind of stuff do they have to you know, navigate? Big boulder sections, giant hill climbs. I mean, wet roots and mud. And there's certain sections where the spectators, you know, since we're talking about spectating, like you can actually help these riders get through this terrain, which is really neat. Uh-huh. So if you're spectating and you see Jarvis coming up and this is a section where you can help him out, like that's kind of cool as a spectator to hang out and be able to like help one of these guys you've watched but on I, TV uh, for forever, which is pretty right, sweet. Right. But, but I think it speaks volumes to how hard yeah, this exa- stuff is yeah, where it's, it's a like, very good point. Yeah. And, and, the, and the thing is like, it's, unmerciful like you're watching some of this stuff and like if some dude makes a wrong slip and he kind of like stops (laughs) 
other folks will just run him over. Literally like, run the, him over, body and It's butt. insane. <laughs> and so when, so that's why I, I have a hard time when people talk about like, oh, is the whoop section of Supercross getting too dangerous? When like you watch some of this enduro stuff and like it's there's no mercy. And the ladders, like, you know, you see the ladders they oh, have to yeah. go up and it's like a river on the other side. So if they goof up, they're just drowning their bike. You know, it's like they, they have wild stuff they go through. So, what I yeah. would say from a watching standpoint, if you're talking about like hard enduros on, on a on a level like you know Red Bull Romaniacs or Erzberg, um, they do a good job of, of providing coverage for that, sure. and they kind of they jump back and forth to different sections, and you can see different people in different sections. It's not like Supercross where you're just watching a start to finish line race, mm-hmm. um, but if you're talking about a, a traditional timekeeping enduro like Brandon would race uh, with, with the ECEA. Um, not very fun. It's not. Yeah, there's no there's no real way to spectate that unless you just post up and watch everybody run through one time in a certain area, um, which some people do. Mm-hmm. But I would say that like a GNCC or a hair scramble is probably more entertaining because you can post up in one area. And if I want to go watch Brandon, I can wait for him and I can see him come through and I can cheer him on. Um, and then I'll wait for him to come again. And that third time when he doesn't come through, I'm like, oh, no, Brandon's hurt. Yeah. He crashed. And, and <laughs> you know, so I think if you're talking about purely spectating at the event, either enduros, uh, which are, are, I'm sure, I'm sorry, either hair scrambles or hard enduros, like Brandon said, you could help out, you could be there. Um, but if you're watching on TV, I think that's where like GNCC or uh, or the, the hard enduros are probably the ones that yeah. I think are the easiest to watch. I totally agree. On TV, I think Red Bull does a great job of covering like Romaniacs. And if you have no idea what we're talking about, you should definitely just hop on YouTube and check that out because it's really entertaining to watch. Yep. But yeah. Yeah. And hopefully you'll find more yeah. information. But I know, yeah. I know in the past, actually, our colleague Jen has mentioned um, that she's pretty impressed with some of the stuff that some of the production value of i think she was talking about tennessee knockout maybe yeah yeah um, it's a great one and, and but some other hard enduro stuff she's like man they do a really bang up job mm-hmm. showing people what's going on and like having cameras placed well and it's not necessarily the easiest type of yeah competition to film but they they put a lot of resources into it yeah. and um even and gncc cool. is is getting better too you can watch that on racer tv and gncc.com i believe um watch it live and, and that's getting better too and that's more that kind of hair scramble style where you know where they disappear into the woods is what i'm trying to say but they're getting better at it right for sure. right so right yeah right. and it's interesting because i think a lot of that comes into um you know there, there's some that you can watch it live and then there's some that you can watch it and after the fact and i think that's where like when you get into like the advancement of gopro technology oh, and yeah. on bike cameras and they cut you know when you were talking yeah. oh yeah. exactly and that's where i think it adds a lot because um you know, when we were talking about motorcycle racing generations ago, uh, On Any Sunday was a program that we've talked about, or a movie that we've talked about in this program before. And, you know, it's funny to see some of the behind the scenes footage where they have these giant reel to reel cameras, you know, yeah, duct yeah. taped to totally. helmets. And, like, that's how they got the shot, you know, and it weighed like an extra 20 pounds. Oh, and man. now it's like we have this little, you know, two pound, not even pound and a half little right, camera right. that you can stick on a helmet. Um, yeah, and not even, I mean, honestly, I, I have no idea what a GoPro weighs. It's probably yeah. nothing. And, <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's unbelievable. So I think the access and the, and the point of view that you get with some of these races now is really exciting. But if you are listening to this program and you really want to get a better idea of any of the different aspects of what we're talking about, like, like Zach and Brandon mentioned, you can just go to YouTube and type in like GNCC or, you know, Red Bull Romaniacs. And there's all these great yeah. clips and recaps and, and, and footage you can watch even after the fact if you if you missed watching it live. I will say, yeah, too, I, if you haven't, oh, sorry to interrupt you there, Zach. No, no, good. But if you haven't seen a hair scramble live or anything like that, it is incredibly fun to go watch that stuff live because you've got 40 guys on a row. They take <laughs> off. They're all just blitzing to the same corner. They don't know what the track's going to be like. And then you can just run around and watch them from different perspectives guys and girls and it's, yeah guys, guys and, and girls, girls sorry both. and uh and it's just really backwoods everyone's super friendly it's just it's just a really good time and it might might cost you like a five dollar gate fee you know what i mean and you can be right beside the riders coming through you can hawk a loogie on them if you want to please let don't, me ask but. you a question <laughs> hypothetically no, no. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> never would do that <laughs> brandon do you think like you talk about how it's backwoodsy and it's super inviting do you think that your southern accent plays you know a, a little oh, bit oh, into yeah. that yeah Oh, yeah, so just I mean, they hear you talk and they're right like, he's there. one of us. Bring him on in. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, so, so I want to I want to move on. But before we move on to the next topic, Zach, uh, let's we should probably break for the podcast uh, so we can get in a word from our sponsor, Motul. 
Yoki doke, we're back uh, talking about the best spectacle in off-road motorcycle racing. What we've covered so far, uh, supercross, motocross, hard enduros, uh, cross country, hair scrambles, stuff like that. You might say, uh, I don't know, hopefully this is not too big a generalization, but typical dirt bike stuff. <laughs> I think I agree. I agree. I, yeah, I, I, that, that's kind of like the it's way like I think about it. Like your good old boy dirt bike racing stuff. Yeah, yeah, and like if you tell if you sell if you tell someone you know I race dirt bikes, it's like a person that that doesn't know about motorcycles. They're gonna think about something in that vein. Yeah, right. That's a good point. But there's also other types of off-road motorcycle competition um, that are worth talking about, and some of them are pretty exciting to to um, to watch. I think. Yeah. Uh, and I know that. Uh, Spurgeon Dunbar is a big fan of um, the KTM 890 <laughs> Adventure R Rally Edition, and I can only assume that means he's very familiar with rally racing. <laughs> All I'll say, so I think everything up until this, I'm gonna I'm gonna ignore that little comment. Um, <laughs> I did buy a new motorcycle, and I haven't talked oh, about it yet in the podcast. I was waiting. For no, it. I, I haven't I haven't talked about it, but yeah. uh, my. Brand new KTM. Well, not brand new. It's used. I bought a used KTM 890. It's basically, brand Adventure new. R it Rally. Looks very clean. Um, despite the fact that it has the rally name to it and it carries over some of the uh, spirit of a rally bike, it is much bigger than a traditional rally bike. Mm. But yes, Zach, it is a great point in the fact that everything we've talked up and up, up about up until this point is essentially the same. 250, 450 engine class, usually. Uh, Enduros might have some variations there, but they yep. look like a dirt bike. Um, when we're talking about rally racing, trials, flat track, these are different machines. These are yes. these are not yes. what, we're, what we've been talking about up until this point, and I think that's a good transition into rally racing. Um, I'll throw out the historical piece of this, and then we can we can run with it. But roots of rally racing actually go back further than than motocross to around 1894 uh, with the Paris to Rowan uh, horseless carriage race. And I was a lot say, of this did motorcycles <laughs> exist back then. What a way they did. <laughs> but a lot of this a lot of this started in Europe with uh, the, the the early event of of automobiles, right? And and it was more of a how far can you push them? How far are they going to be reliable for? Um, and and it was a fun thing to do with these new horseless carriages that came around. <laughs> um, and then really, what you get into is you get into uh, a, a variation of what was you know we talked earlier about the international six days trial, which became the international six days enduro, which was yep. a race that was. Uh, six days, man and machine, or you know, woman and machine, uh, and really, you had you were responsible for taking care of your bike, for navigating a course, and then you had to do it again the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and you started in one point, and you ended up in a different point, and that's really what we're talking about when we talk about rally racing. Um, some of the right. events are just a day long. Uh, some of the events, like uh, I have a friend Steve who races the Sandblast Rally down in South Carolina. Um, I actually went through the rally training course uh, for the the NASA to to be able to ride that. And the biggest difference here is that you have to have roadbook training. There's a navigation element right, to this. Right. It's not just about going as it's fast as you can on that course. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, you have to be able to figure out where you're going. Unlike you know Brandon that just keeps going around in a circle over and over and over again, <laughs> uh, right. you actually have to be able to read a map if you're going to go rally like, racing. I can't even do the math for the enduro, so yeah, I would be <laughs> just. Yeah. And and just to uh, just to clarify, sort of the most famous uh, uh, global spotlight rally race is the the Dakar, which yeah. which uh, goes back to Paris actually, Dakar. Right, Paris the Dakar, yep. um, which. Presumably, did that grow from the Paris to Rouen thing that so, you looked up, Spurge? I looked you, that up. History guy. It, apparently, it started. Apparently, Paris was a racing hub for rally because in Britain there were speed limits that were imposed very early on. Of like, I thought this is pretty funny too. The speed limit in Britain in like nineteen. 19- 13 was like 12 miles an hour. And like, if you went more than 12 miles an hour, you were a rebel. Um, but apparently they didn't have the same restrictions. So, um, the, the Paris rallies eventually grew to like Paris to Germany, Paris, you know, to Munich or, um, different locations around Europe. And I think it was post world war two when it grew into the, you know, obviously then they, they had started to have exposure to Africa um, post-World War II, and it was, there were some rally races that happened in Africa, and eventually it grew into what was, you know, Paris to, to Dakar. Hmm. 
So yeah, there, there's definitely, yeah. I think it all stemmed from, you know, some of those early races and it eventually became what, what we have today. And now it's not even, you know, traditionally Paris to Dakar. You know, we raced for a while. Uh, the Dakar race Saudi was South Arabia. America and now it's yeah. Saudi Arabia. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. definitely, it's a name, it's a name and, and, and it kind of harkens back to what these originally races, these races originally were. Um, but the right. locations really don't tie to the name too much anymore. Right. But the, but the, 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 the objective and some of the skills that you have to have are the same, which is basically you have to take off across the desert. You got to figure out where you're going. Yep. You have to get to these checkpoints. Um, and we did, we did mention Dakar a little bit because of uh, our, our, our buddy, Daniel Petrucci there, the MoGP rider who took on Dakar and was able to win a stage. Anyway, this type of, this type of racing is, uh, is kind of cool in a couple ways. Um, one, because it's like, pretty primal right you're sort of like all right you gotta take off across the thing yeah exactly and figure out where you're going and good luck um but also i think it's kind of cool because with that car anyway um there are also uh buggy there are cars there are four wheelers big trucks trucks. they're like the six wheel drive (laughs) trucks that race um which carry supplies for some of the other teams but they they just decide to race them also at some point um (laughs) And so that's kind of cool too, because you can see it's, it's rare that you see a motorcycle competition take place and then be like, all right, well dude, bro on a four wheeler is also going to do this. And then what's his toes in a buggy is going to take it on too. And you can kind of see how capable the machines are compared to each other. But it also fun. gets super dangerous. Like, I don't know if you guys saw oh, yeah. at, at the car well, oh, this yeah, year. The guy, yeah. Yeah. That's- yeah, we're all about to say the same thing. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. D- describe what happened, yeah, Rich. Go for it. He got run, like he just ran over, like there was a motorcyclist that was like kind of broken down or stuck. He was and, stuck, yeah. Think, and it, yeah. and, it, and it, it, it was a guy in a truck, right? I'm, 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 if I remember correctly, a car. I think it was, it was a car. car. I thought, okay, it was I thought a bu- it was what they a truck, car or buggy or something. Yeah, yeah, because I think, well, that's the other thing too. When they refer to, to the trucks, they're referring to the big dump truck looking things. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it looks like, like it an depends. apartment building on yeah. wheels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But this, anyway, this, this guy in a large vehicle just ran over a, a motorcyclist and his bike. And then I think he did it again later on too, right? Like it was like he did it once and then he did it again. He did it twice, yeah. yeah. And I think he got DQ'd, right? Or he got he ended up getting docked a bunch of. He should have because people were like, hey, you can't just run over people on yeah. motorcycles, which is a good allegory for society, I think. Uh, but anyway, um, the the um, the race is pretty cool, um, and and uh, and it is a little bit harder, I think, from a spectator standpoint. Exactly. Would you guys agree? That's what I was about to, to say. Kind of like, like follow along, like you can yeah. follow highlight shows and well, that kind of thing. And, but it's, and even it's a if you're trickier. there, right? Like, what are you going to oh, spectate? Yeah, 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 you're just yeah. hanging out in the pits, and they disappear, and then like, yeah. what? Like, you know, you know, if you happen to be in <coughs> Saudi Arabia, yeah. or to be fair, um, I guess you if know, you have the, a helicopter another... and could just follow people around, like, <laughs> you know, cool, but. right? Um, and I guess I would say that what falls into this race also is sort of like. Um, uh, the the Baja one thousand Baja one thousand yep uh, mm-hmm. Sonora yeah, there's Sonora um, Sonora Mint Tecate like yep. the, the races like this that are like um yeah they're they're sort of like take off across the desert yeah, and figure yeah. out where you're trying to go races what but I what Dakar I will is say kind of the biggest one Dakar is the biggest but I think probably in the motorcycling community um, I would say Baja one thousand is probably equally as famous because so right. many people have have watched you know the right. the movies um, and. And there's been, and there's right. also like, there's an element of this where like you can't really watch it per se, but like a lot of times you can go down and you can go to the starting point, and there's like a big party in Mexico when everything's right. kicking off, and <laughs> right. and it's it's definitely has probably a little bit more and, of a tangible aspect to America yeah. racing. And I don't want to detra- you know, derail the train. I was going to say, but do you guys know how much it costs to race in a Dakar? Like, isn't it just over a hundred thousand dollars? Yeah, like. I have, buddy, I, I have a buddy. I have a buddy. I knew it was who, expensive, but I, raced, I meant to look that up. But. And I think I think it was like it was either the second or the third time he had to go to his wife and be like, "I'm gonna take a second mortgage out on the house." And his wife was like, "Okay." And wow. I cannot imagine my girlfriend being like, "Here's what like we want to support <laughs> you." A strong relationship. Yeah, in this race that actually pays you nothing. <laughs> right. uh, so let's go take out a second mortgage <laughs> yeah, on the house so you can go back. Second mortgage, so yeah. I can go destroy my bike and my body, yeah. and you know, hopefully survive. Yep. Yeah, it's great. And uh, we should we should be clear too that something like the the I we we lumped all these together, but something like the Baja 1000 is different mm-hmm. than mm-hmm. Dakar in so much as it's a one go. Like that's what's kind of cool about the Baja One Thousand. Yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. you take off and you just gotta like go a thousand miles down the peninsula of Baja California as fast as you can. Awesome. Whereas 
Yeah, which is da- whereas Dakar is like there are stages that are broken it's two out. Weeks, so it's like, it's like go, two weeks long. Yeah, yeah. It's two weeks long. You like each day you have like a stage or two, and it's like I mean some of the stages are long and it's grueling and it's and they difficult. have the marathon Don't, stage wrong, too different. where no one can help you no matter what. It's like you are absolutely on your own, no assistance from your team or any other people out there. Except right. Well, that's why I yes, think it's like you crazy. would never. You would never turn into a supercross race and see someone riding on the <laughs> rim of their motorcycle, like just doing laps without a tire. But I can't tell you how many times you've seen like a clip from like the car where like the the individual is just not going to give up, yeah. and they're floored, and they're like, "That guy's not really going that fast." And it's because like they zoom in, and there's no rear tire, and it's just the rim just going, <laughs> trying to like keep keep the keep the race momentum up, you know. That's, so it's definitely that's, a survival aspect of it. Oh yeah, so gnarly. Yeah. But I guess yeah. again, um, that, that comes back to the original question of you know has it gotten too hard and when you're thinking about supercross the more you get into these other types of racing you realize how easy in a way uh you know some of the supercross folks have it well i think it's it's based a little bit on expectations too like if you're comparing uh you know the dakar rally to supercross obviously there are just so many differences yeah um with you know whatever the bikes the 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 setup the the terrain whatever but i think that the expectation of the rider and the, I don't know, the expectation of the competitor as they go into a stage and they're, they sort of think like, well, it's up to me to decide how hard to push. That's one of the things about doing the Dakar rally or, or, or any kind of like long, you know, um, uh, rally race like that is as you approach a turn, as you approach a jump, as you, as you work your way through the day, through the stage, whatever it is, you have to decide how hard you're pushing oh, yeah. because you that's part of it right you're mm-hmm. sort of like, like i trust myself to go this fast through this section or i need to i need to be cautious because i can't right. get hurt because this is a long race energy because you've got to go all yeah. day you don't even know the terrain and ahead of you which is exactly and, yeah. and i think that the supercross the thing the thing that i think uh, our friend patrick garvin was reaching for in that article and that you you addressed it to a certain extent brandon is that it's not that the whoop section of a supercross track is too difficult for someone to navigate. Mm-hmm. That's not the issue. Right. The issue is if I don't send it 110% through this section, then someone else will. Right. And they're going to win. Right. And in order to win, I have to do it at 111%. Yeah. And then and then if you make like you said you make a tiny mistake, tiny mistake and all of a sudden both your chain. wrists are broken yeah. and you're out for yeah, exactly. That's wild. Whereas like Dakar is more about not that in the Dakar you can't make a tiny mistake and and break both your wrists because you certainly can. Oh, yeah. Um <laughs> but I think that like the way that you know the way that the the rider approaches it and the expectations they have of how hard they're going to have to try are a little bit easier to measure in something like that rather than being like, well, I guess I just have to yeah. hope that this works out. So yeah. let me, I'm going to back up with a question. Putting, yeah. I'm going to back yeah. up with a question. So Brandon, okay. you've, mm-hmm. you, Brandon, you've raced, have you raced motocross? Uh, I do a turkey scramble, which is a hair scramble and the motocross track combined, which is always fun to do that every year. And then you go and you do regular motocross track days. Yeah, I, I do. Yes. But I've never okay. like raced it because it's just not my forte. So. Okay. And Zach, have you ever raced motocross? Oh, definitely not. Okay. <laughs> So I guess my point that I was getting at is I want to I want to kind of back up to my previous statement where I was like, mm-hmm. oh, you know, some of these other races, it's more dangerous. I don't think it's more dangerous to, to get to back to Zach's point here. Um, I, I don't think racing a Dakar is more dangerous as far as like kicking, you know, 70 feet in the air. Mm-hmm. But like right. if you go the wrong way and make a rule book mistake, like you could <laughs> die. Um, a road book, road book, road, mistake. road book mistake, yeah, yeah. and yeah, yeah. in the same way. But you, you know, you're gonna probably, um, you know, uh, uh, run out of water, and then all of a sudden you're gonna be dehydrated, and <laughs> yeah. that's how you go. Whereas I think, from an actual obstacle standpoint, motocross and supercross is more dangerous with some of the things that you have to probably. You it's know, a, tackle at, at a speed and, and a performance yeah. in which to be able right. to it's win. Just a, it's a and, totally different skill set, right? These guys are training right. day in, day out for this specific thing, you know, jumping their motorcycle on the specific right, right, terrain, right. whereas Dakar is like, there's so much that's unknown, you know what I mean? And, and to your point about dehydration and carrying extra water and all right. that kind of stuff, it's just, they're just different, you know? But Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, the, and the, I mean, the, the also the big thing there, right, is that motocross, supercross, you do it lap after lap after lap, yeah. whereas... You know, the Dakar, you're you're navigating a set of terrain, and and for the most part, you're not revisiting it, or you know, you're not revisiting it 45 seconds later sure, anyway, sure. Yeah, unless yeah. you're very lost. <laughs> so, but ease, to, to ease of wa- ease of watching is rally racing easy to watch? No, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. You have to be pretty 
committed to it. Yeah. Would you guys agree? Yeah, yeah. totally. Especially yeah. you have to follow along to the website. You have to check points every day. You have to like keep it, right. keep it. It's it, it's not as easy for the spectator. Like weird times of the day too. And that's right. And they're like, but... they're highlight shows you can see, which are pretty cool. But, um, and, and that's, it's a fun way to keep, keep up on things. But, but it is, it is like, yeah. it's not as, it's not as kind of plug and play. Yeah. You can't get the full spectrum, full story yeah. of it all. So, so, I'd like to I'd like to pivot to you mentioned trials Spurge and we had that on the list mm. of something to talk about because I feel like um, it's interesting to me that something like you know um, a, a rally race like we were just talking about is sort of impressive because you think like wow you have to navigate and you have to figure out what you're doing and you have to be able to like you know change a tire if you get stuck or you know you have to there are lots of kind of like problem solving things that you have to do whereas trials is very it's it's an extremely specific type yeah. of bike and an extremely specific obstacle that is made to be more or less impossible. Right. And the goal is extremely, uh, uh, short and clear. Yes. Just try to get through <laughs> this horrible thing without putting or your if feet it's down, this, <laughs> without putting your feet down. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, and the skill set that the riders develop is, is amazing. And, and like from a specific, like sort of dexterity and, 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 motorcycle control standpoint it's oh, super man. impressive but a, a total departure from the type of difficulty that we're talking about when we're talking about rally racing right? absolutely yeah but i think you know some of the greatest riders like we talked about you know jarvis i'm sure most people know jarvis if you know anything about dirt bikes and things like that like they all started you know riding trials bikes these little basically right. mountain bikes with engines in them <laughs> which are crazy and i've ridden one and they're super fun and it still like blows my mind some of the things i've seen people do on trials bikes it's just yeah. absolutely absurd um yeah it takes such a, a finesse but i will say you know since we're talking about spectating um watching it on a very amateur level is pretty boring sorry guys for why anyone here like why why is that well they're you're talking about you're talking about trials yeah specifically. yeah trial specifically yeah. because they're just like a lot of times they're just little courses set out in the woods and they look like it would be super fun to do but watching someone else you know go <laughs> two miles per hour and peter patter around on this little wood trail is just like okay it's like watching golf but almost worse um <laughs> another but, golf comparison but, but the high side low side audience is <laughs> I don't even play golf. I've literally like never played a real round of golf in my life, which is hilarious. But I, miniature golf, it's, I mean, it's, love, it's, it's, yeah, as, it's as exciting top, as miniature golf. And, and top golf, yeah, that's great. But uh, yeah, it's but on you know a pro level like the uh, the X Trials, for example, not to be confused with the X Files, but uh, I think the guy's name is like Tony Boo, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, he's like the top dog up there he's got a lot of wins under his belt but that's like an arena style similar to supercross but it's set up right. specifically for x trials that is so impressive to watch and i think impressive whether you're watching it on tv or if you're watching it live because the stuff that they do your mind is just like how oh. the hell are they doing it's this this is completely crazy. berserk yeah, yeah. so and so just to give, uh, in case you're not familiar with trials, as, as Brandon said, they almost look like mountain bikes with engines and they're, yeah. they're very live, small no motorcycles seat. with a big, yeah. there's basically no seat. There's, there's a seat in the middle of the bike, right, but, it's, but it's, it's way, way out yeah. and it's completely useless. And the foot pegs are probably a foot from the seat, if, if not less. <laughs> and, um, they use, um, like really gummy soft tires with very little air in them. So you yep. can see the tires like flexing and, and like, uh, and gripping things because they try to jump over or they, they try and scramble over like, you know, uh, big concrete culverts that are tipped over or yeah. old cars or whatever. So they, they want all the grip they can get into stuff, man. Yeah. Um, so the, so they're very, uh, very specific looking motorcycles and they're very strange. <laughs> and the way that they're ridden by top level riders, like, uh, uh, like Tony Boo, like, uh, Brandon mentioned is like, Basically, it's 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 hard to it's hard to compare it to any type, type, other type of motorcycle yeah, riding. Like yeah, they yeah. can literally stop and stay in one place. Like they don't. They'll just they they'll just yeah they're stand balanced. in one place without touching the ground. Yeah. yeah, without without doing anything. And then they'll hop over to something else. And they can they can jump from obstacle yeah. to obstacle only touching their rear tire. It's freaking yeah. if you ever because if they put their feet down, they get penalized. So you have to exactly. stay on the pegs right. and balance. So their finesse and balance is just on a level that Berserk. I will yeah. never. Understand. If you've ever watched the gymnastics at the Olympics, that's exactly <laughs> this is like the gymnastics you know, yeah, of, of motorcycle riding. Actually, it's a great yeah, it kind of like yeah. it's almost like a floor exercise slash like a parallel bars <laughs> when they do all the flips mm -hmm. and like they catch themselves on the next bar. Mm -hmm. That's a good analogy. Spurs. But there's like no, that. but it's not, it's, it's not traditional racing where it's like a start and a finish line. 
nah. per se. It's it's there's usually a course that you have to get through, but it's mm-hmm. not about right. who gets there first. It's about who does it um, without sacrificing points for putting your foot down. You have to maintain balance and dexterity. Um, a lot of times you have to like launch the bike, you know, without any momentum. You know, yeah. you're not you can't wheelie. Yeah, there's no with, run up. There's yeah. no run up. Yeah. And this stuff is so difficult that they oftentimes have spotters trying to like be like, dude, you got to get your back tire just like right, right. there. You know, trying to help them out or, because it's so gnarly. Yeah. Or the spotter will be there literally to catch, catch the bike yeah. so that mm-hmm. it doesn't fall on top of the rider. Because they're going, I mean, it's hard to over yeah. exaggerate how difficult this stuff <laughs> yeah. is, but it'll be like a 15 or 20 foot, I mean, cliff, yeah. just like a rock face. Yeah. And you're like, there's there's no way to get up they're that. Like going you up could like maybe climb up it. Yeah, it's just like... yeah, exactly. And then they just like billy goat up these things and you're like, what the what? <laughs> anyway. So, um, so I, I want to of... back up before we talk about the spectator part of this. Oh, so okay. yeah. you yeah. guys had mentioned the fact that these bikes have gotten very specific. However, mm-hmm. right. does anybody know where trials riding got its start? Uh oh. Historically speaking. Typical I millennial. Was, I do not. <laughs> I believe it was Albania. Um, and the, the prince wanted a way for his mountain bike to be able to keep up with his friends who are in better shape. I have no idea. <laughs> I, I was, was like, going to say, oh that's, not what I, that's not what I heard. Uh, <laughs> okay, was, tell everyone how it actually came. <laughs> so it's funny because like I thought, like for me, that's what great. I thought was really exciting about this was, you know, whether we're researching Supercross or Motocross or, or Enduro, it's people started by just taking regular motorcycles and adapting them to like what they wanted to do with them. Um, and with trials from, from what I read, it started in Scotland and it was really about hill climbs and and these, these individuals, just like golf, just like golf. (laughs) I mean, the parallels are uncanny (laughs) and the goats and (laughs) (laughs) yeah, some people were riding goats up the hill and other people were riding motorcycles, (laughs) but no, um, so what they started doing was they started modifying the bikes to have really heavy flywheels so that you could you could lug them really aggressively down low and the engines wouldn't right. stall out. And that yeah. was like the first modification. And then much like we talked about with like 1966 in the world of motocross and like the real specificity of, of motorcycles shifting, you know, in different mm-hmm. directions from the late 60s on, uh, that's really where you saw this. Uh, you know, parallel kind of go into the trials direction. One of the earlier bikes that I had read about, and I'm hoping that our producer Bernie can pull this up on the screen, was an Aerial HT5. And oh, at the time, tell it me looked, more. yeah, it looked very yeah. much like a like a vintage dirt bike, but it, the seat was lower, and it was definitely starting to get a little bit more. Um, it didn't conform to what you thought as a motorcyclist, and that was really kind of one of the early shifting points that I found, and. To the point where now you look at these these bikes, these are not like let's go out for a Sunday ride and have no, a good no, time. No. There's no way to ride this bike other than in a trials course. You would never want to. And, it's, and I've yeah. ridden one. Brandon says that it's fun. I found it to be incredibly <laughs> difficult. Uh, the shifter lever is like much further out, so to like to shift the bike, you have to kind of like reach down and hit it, like because the the idea is Very that you strange. can shift the bike if it's like completely vertical mm-hmm, on you. Mm-hmm. Um, so Brandon said it was a good time. I, I think trials riding, I would need a lot more practice on before uh, I was enjoying myself regularly on yeah. a Sunday. Yeah. And I I will say from a spectator standpoint, um, it is in my experience hard to it's hard for me to get excited about like tuning into an event right and watching it all take place but if you're gonna pull up clips of something on instagram or youtube wow yeah. is it a fun rabbit just, hole to go just down because type in tony boo x trials <laughs> yeah, and you'll be like blown that's, away that's that's uh uh b-o-u yes. is how you spell his last name so we might be saying it wrong for all we know it, but it is anyway. pronounced boo if i'm not mistaken okay, but it is spelled wrong, exactly how you just spelled it so <laughs> I have a fun, I have kind of, well, maybe it's not that fun. It won't take up very much time, I promise. Mm-hmm. I have a fun uh, Tony Boo story. Oh. I went to uh, ICMA, the big um, motorcycle exhibition in Italy, and I went to uh, a Honda presentation where Honda that year, it was like 2013 or something like that. They were unveiling all their new models. So they like, there's a big auditorium, and um, and they had people riding the bikes out onto the stage. Um, so they would have like, a person would ride out on a CBR 600 and they'd be like the 2013 CBR or 2014 CBR 600 or whatever. And, uh, I had ridden, I had just recently ridden the Grom for the first time nice. at the press launch and naturally riding a, a Honda Grom, which is a little 125 CC sort of quasi mini bike. I was trying to wheelie it mm-hmm. and I was able to wheelie it a little bit. And I'm like, I'm sort of like, I'm okay at wheelies. I'm not, I'm no pro at wheelies, but I'm, I'm pretty you're, good in general. You're pretty and good. I had Come trouble on. being modest there. I had trouble wheeling this Grom and I was like, 
or I had trouble doing like long, good wheelies on it. And I was like, huh, that's kind of surprising. But like, you know, whatever. It's not made for wheelies and that's fine. So I'm at this exhibition in Eichma and they're like the 2014 uh, Honda Grom. And the person rides out on the stage and they just pop a wheelie and they ride all the way down the stage doing a wheelie at like five miles an hour, nice and smooth as you like. And they put the front wheel down and they turn around and they do a wheelie down the whole stage, nice and gentle. And they put it down. And the whole time I'm watching, I'm like, what the... What? Who, Who like, is this? Yeah, are you kidding me? Uh, like this person, they, like some random model uh, they hired to ride the Grom out can just like do. Is this amazing. how Italians are? And we could just do a wheelie. And then, and then they were like, "Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Boo." And I was like, oh, oh, "Trials thank champion, goodness. blah blah blah." Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. Like uh, nine-time world trials right, right, champion. Right. And I was like, "Okay, well, that makes me feel a little better yeah. about so not being not, that's a great not to <laughs> not to belabor uh, your wheelie your wheelie story here, um, but like." I was it the I think I had I was having a conversation with your dad where like you'd come home from school every day and you would like wheelie through like town like the little small town uh-huh. that you grew up on in on my mountain bike yeah 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 okay yeah so I mean you yeah. started at an early age with your wheelie <laughs> appreciation I did. Say I did. So my, did my I. dad from the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Wheelies, wheelies bring us all together. That's right. Okay, so the last, the last um, discipline, which is very broad, obviously, that I'd like to talk about today is sort of um, flat track racing. Um, where it's American flat track, world speedway, whatever, um, which is, uh, basically, uh, they're, they're dirt ovals of various sizes and, and all the bikes leave at the same time, you know, green flag go a whole grid of bikes takes off and you just go around a circle, a, a, a predetermined number of times until they wave a checkered flag. And then whoever gets their first wins, it's extremely simple. And I think this is an interesting conversation to have, especially pivoting from trials where trials is sort of like the ultimate expression of how how difficult an obstacle can be in front of you mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and and can the rider and machine tackle uh, conquer that and then flat track is like the turn, simplest turn left course yeah yeah exactly if you like turn nascar twice, you're gonna like you're <laughs> yeah exactly so it's sort of like the simplest possible obstacle in front of you but who can do that simple obstacle the best and quickest the, the most and, consistently yeah, yeah, whatever yeah. which is i think an interesting kind of dichotomy in spectating and they're both interesting for different reasons um but uh, what, what's your what are your guys kind of gut instincts well actually I, sorry should spurgeon should you tell us about the history of oh, flat yeah, track? Well, I, mean, history. I, I assume you <laughs> yeah but i feel like we ha- i feel like we haven't done a guest <laughs> honors either thing and like normally we do guest honors well, and he, i feel like we haven't really given brandon the opportunity to talk first but i'm never going to turn down across he started with supercross yeah. motocross yeah, I'm sure. good. okay he did. You, well you, you take it's it. no brandon made the comment a, a few minutes ago here about uh, you know it's like nascar right mm-hmm. and out of all the forms of racing that we've <laughs> talked Southern about today heritage. i know <laughs> yeah, i mean i could give you the history of nascar too oh, and like bootleg we could moonshine get like bootlegging and, moonshine and, and <laughs> like bootleg and liquor yeah. oh yeah <laughs> and it's funny because like then you could talk about like we talk about uh, famous roads and and motorcycling in america and uh yeah. The, the uh, Deals Gap, or the Dragon, if you will, was actually a famous bootlegging road uh, back at the... Anyway, I don't want to get too far into that. But <laughs> I wish um, <laughs> we could. I wish we could. But yeah, you're probably right. We should. But uh, out of all the racing that we talked about today, flat track is American in its heritage. Flat track was something that, that was born from True. the board Brother. track racing. Uh, board, track, board track racing was... Uh, too many people were dying, so they're like, well, let's figure out a different way to race motorcycles in an oval. <laughs> and they're like, well, let's just get rid of the you know the oily wooden planks and we'll just put out you know a dirt oval and that's how people will do it. Um, and and that, that shift kind of happened again around-ish World War II. But whereas everything else we talked about here, you know, kind of was brought over from Europe at least at some point right. in its heritage. Uh, American like the flat Albanian track. prince, exactly. Yeah, much like yeah, Zach's exactly. story of how the trials, <laughs> you know, a rider began. Um, I love yeah, that. flat track. Flat track was an American form of racing, and it started with Indian and Harley Davidson. Um, you know, and and it's to this day, you know, Indian and, Indian and, and Harley <laughs> Davidson are are you know pr- premier you know uh, f- motorcycles Bikes. in yeah. the in the in the flat track arena. Right. American mm-hmm. flat track, as it's called now, right? It's true. AFT. Right, right. That's right. Um, yeah, and I, and I think you know, from a spectating standpoint, it's pretty, it's pretty often pretty good racing, right? Like yeah. these bikes don't have front brakes. Uh, I'm talking about uh, American flat track specifically. Yep. There's there's no front brakes. They just barrel around these tracks, and they have to slide to slow down, and they have to slide to get through the corners. And it's very kind of like I don't know. It's kind of heart pounding the first time you see it, and when you start to learn more about the 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 riders and how they have to control the bikes and what they do at speed, uh, it's I think I think it's a it's a pretty excellent spectator sport especially in person have you totally guys have you guys agree. been able to see aft in person yeah and i was just to your point there um i was gonna make 
you know, I used to edit footage of AFT for Cycle Gear stores. We'd have to cut it down. And watching it on TV, like, it's still exciting. Like, I still enjoyed it. But watching right. it live is just like a completely other yeah. level. Like, if you're going to agree. watch it and try to get into it in any capacity, you got to be there. It's so loud. You're, you're right there at the track, too, which is really cool because it's not usually you know, this big stadium or anything like that. Like you can really right. get right there with the rider. So it's, it's yeah. really cool. Do you Especially, find, do you find it's, do you find it's more engaging to watch or easier to watch than other forms of racing, Brandon? Live in person. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And on the screen, I mean, you, you get everything. It's a big oval track, but yeah, I mean, you can get every little bit in detail, I think live, uh, for most of the, the, the races. So, and it's just, I mean, I've, they, if they crash, it's usually pretty catastrophic, you know, because they're they're wheel to wheel. I mean, they're right on each other, as Zach right. pointed out, no front brake. So if someone goes down, it can get pretty crazy pretty fast. And if if if, mo if motocross is uh, is golf essentially for the analogy for people, then I would say that uh, American <laughs> flat track is like horse racing, right? Except for instead of betting on the ponies, uh, you just have you know motorcycles that are going around in an oval. Uh, Very similar, I would say. Uh, yeah, questionable. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think the internet's not going to agree with that one, but that that brings up the the the, the topic of where they do these things too. And like, you know, Brandon was saying, it's like, it's kind of sketchy sometimes because when they crash, they, they're all over each other or they go into a wall or something. They often take place at fairgrounds mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. they're just in these sort of like old yeah. arenas <laughs> that are, there's just like a, there's like a post fence around the outside with hay bales yeah. near it. And think about like your high school sort of like, football luck, field type of <laughs> yeah, feel yeah. to it. You know what I mean? Just on a little oval track. <laughs> it's kind of, but the beaut but the beauty of that is that this, I would say out of everything that we're talking about here, um, is one of the more grassroots, you know, oh, yeah. types of racing, Certainly. right? Yeah, you're absolutely. not gonna you're not gonna head out to your your local fairground and watch somebody doing a Dakar rally event where they're no, no. racing through the neighborhood. <laughs> but you right. could go out and find, in you know, you know, maybe in a few towns over, you know, a a, a flat track race to go to on a yeah. Saturday night or all day on a Saturday. I know uh, Lemmy and I used to go up. There was one up in New York, and we would drive mm -hmm. up, and um, you could sit there and, and watch them watch them go around the track all day. Uh, and then to that point, in some cases, this is a really easy event to participate in because you can do like a run with your brung class and you can take right. your bike out and just be like, I'm going to sign up for the beginner thing. And then they let you just, you know, yeah. ride around in the oval. Revzilla, so. we had a, uh, a flat track night, actually, where we took we had like a scooter what? out Did, there. Mm -hmm. We had, I had my when was that oh, before was... you before you came on? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was before yeah. Here. And, we rented and we had the we whole all... track to ourselves. It was we rented awesome. we rented out yeah we rented out a, a, a track yeah. for the night. We got them to groom it for us, and then we yep. just took down whatever bikes we had, and they just let us go as many Dude, times as we wanted to go. So fun. I had my <laughs> thrusting out there, and it was really sketchy, but it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> I will say though, so for anyone listening to this, what I like about uh, American flat track specifically is you know there are some like uh american super camp is is what i'm is it american yeah, super camp? texas yep. right the no no that's that's Sorry, a different that's... one that's what's the one well, that american texas? super camp american super camp travels, travels. so it'll go yep. to different oh, okay, cities okay. you might be thinking of texas tornado yeah, boot camp yeah, yeah thank you uh which is a Con Edwards thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm thinking. Of, I'm thinking of American Super Camp because that travels. We I got to go de yeah. go do it in Delaware, and I, I think the biggest misconception are people are like, well, I only really ride on the street. I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, go ride flat track oh, in the dirt. Man. But for like 400 right. bucks for the weekend or 500 yeah. bucks, they give you a little bike. You go out there, and it, it actually it makes you a better street rider too. So everything, definitely. yeah, all types of dirt riding translates so well to the street, and I didn't know that either until I started riding dirt bikes, and it made me such a better yeah. street rider. It's, it's, this is. Awesome. Famously, the uh, the era of of um, of of Grand Prix and uh, MotoGP uh, American World Champions. We're not talking about pavement racing today, but <laughs> because because you brought it up, yeah. uh, you know, very famously, all the, the guys that that were winning uh, World Championships in the late '80s and, and early '90s, of, yep. um, uh, you know, uh, Eddie Lawson and Wayne Rainey. They started in um, the dirt. And, yeah, they started with you know, bashing bars with mm -hmm. with at Kenny Roberts Ranch and and flying around in flat track and and um, all those guys you know that that was a that was a something that Americans kind of brought to uh, pavement racing was like learning how to ride well in the yeah. dirt and then uh oh Zach Bless is sneezing you. for those of you uh -oh. listening to the I podcast because yeah, I know I get I got so worked up just yeah. with MoGP coming up that I like <laughs> he I, was he was actually crying he was tearing up folks yeah. and he tried to fake a sneeze. Yeah. But I do. I want to. I want to round things out with a final question, if that's okay with you guys. Please do. Okay. So, the whole point of this was, you know, motorcycle racing off road, 
spectating? Uh, has it gotten too hard? And I want to start with Brandon. Brandon, Uh-oh. final question is, out of everything we've talked about today, what is your favorite type of off-road motorcycling to watch, to participate in, and has Supercross gotten too difficult? <laughs> So to watch, I you know, easy answer for me, Supercross. I love watching that live. Um, but obviously, Erzberg and Romaniacs, things like that, like that is incredibly entertaining as well. But I'm just like so into Supercross right now, so I think that's going to get my vote. Um, yep, yep. I love all those dudes. I've been watching them for years now. Um, favorite to race, easily hair scramble. I love just getting super scrappy with those guys. I mean, it's you know, balls to the wall for two hours straight, racing as hard as you can. Um, and it is super, super fun and just gnarly. It's, it's really gnarly, you know, God made dirt and dirt don't hurt brother. So, uh, wow. That is, that is Southern to the max. And Um, then again, I will say, I will say dirt definitely hurts. I've crashed quite (laughs) a bit. So that there's old old broken leg, old broken leg, uh, wise. Uh, I've hit a lot of trees and they do not move at all. So, (laughs) They just move so your body parts. Final, final answer on Supercross. Has it gotten too difficult? No, you know, I, I don't think it's gotten too difficult. I think the level of racing has just elevated. The bikes have just elevated the power, just the, the suspension, the control they have. So naturally, as the bikes progress, the riding progresses, the training progresses, like everything's just going to, the, the bar is just going to continue to be raised. Like I totally think that's awesome and it's great and, it, and it's but the whoops, yeah, they, it's just something about them. They just take out too many riders, and it just bums me out. I don't know. I don't have the answer. I don't think the whoops should be taken out. I don't think Supercross is too gnarly or too dangerous or any of that stuff. I just think, like, you know, maybe give us a little more sand, maybe chill out the whoops a little bit. I, I don't know. Everyone's <laughs> going to hate me on the Internet for saying that, but it's just like when I see my favorite no. riders just getting torn up, and, and, and you know, Roxon, for example, got his head ran over by Shimoto, like, or not Shimoto. <laughs> I don't think it was Shimoto, but maybe it was Shimoto. Maybe it was a rock. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm getting off doesn't on a tangent matter. here. Somebody's head got run over, Super and it was aggressive. Is awesome. I don't want it to change necessarily, but I don't want riders to just continually get destroyed in the whoops. That's really my answer there. I love that. Well, couldn't, that yeah. could, no, that couldn't have been more clear, Brandon. Yeah, Thank yeah, you yeah. for clarifying <laughs> that for us. And I'm like, here, I mean, let's go on this a, roller coaster, and I'll find a way back. You know, and, that's, yeah. a, that's, a, that's very relatable that you're torn. Uh, on what, yeah, what the, you know, yeah. you, you were self-aware enough to say you don't have, I don't the, answer, have the answer, which I appreciate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't. Yeah. Ronnie Mack with a paintball gun. I think I said in the article, and I know <laughs> that's not the answer. Nice. So, no, you said I, I, my favorite line was when you you threw in the uh, Carrie Underwood, uh, oh, Jesus, Jesus take the, the Jesus take the handlebars. Yeah, Lance, <laughs> Lance messaged me right away. He was like, "That is one of the best." That know, was yeah. Out of all the things that I've read <laughs> in Common Tread in 2022, that was one of my favorite yeah. uh, quotes from you. <laughs> You're welcome, um, You're Zach. Welcome. What about yourself? If you had to say favorite to watch, favorite to participate in. Has Supercross gotten too dangerous? Anything that you want to throw out? My favorite to watch is flat track, uh, or and quick quick call out to Speedway, uh, which is sort of uh, if American flat track is American flat track, then this is European flat track. <laughs> um, Speedway goes back a long way. Uh, it's got a rich history that we did not get into, and we do apologize. Um, but it's basically uh, very short tracks, very short races. They're usually four laps long. The races are usually 40 or 45 seconds long total. And they do a whole bunch of heats. And then finally, and then there's a final, um, uh, but the bikes are super gnarly, no clutches, single gear, no suspension. Um, they get extremely sideways. It's very fun to watch, uh, especially in person. But anyway, back to answer your question, American flat track, I think is probably my, my favorite type of off-road riding to, to, to watch and i think it's because i'm a road race guy and i think i can i represent with i like yeah. watching the riders like fight for traction yeah, yeah, yeah. i like the simplicity cool. of it i like the purity of sort of like go into the corner as fast as you dare go through the corner as fast as you can wait as long as possible to shut off the throttle and just kind of like manage the bike through this whole process so i i get a kick out of watching that uh even though i will say that as a spectacle supercross is pretty is pretty excellent from the from the from the, yeah. from the jumps to the to the power technics to the to the yeah, yeah, yeah. to the tv production quality it's great <laughs> um and then as for what my favorite one to compete in uh i've never competed off-road but i think i would i think like a hair scramble style thing would be what i would get a kick yeah. out of because i like riding in the woods and i'd like i like the technical aspect of it it's not like i don't do so well with big jumps <laughs> so i like the kind of technical aspect of of you know trying to get through sections as, as quickly as possible and sort of like you know uh maintaining your energy or you know sort of pacing yourself that kind of thing yeah. I, 
I think I would like. Well, that we got a three fifty waiting for you if you come to the East Coast. We'll get you in a hair scramble. So I know twenty twenty two goal. So yeah. <laughs> Riding with you guys. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. Agreed. I like it. Um, and then has Supergirls gotten too difficult? I don't think so. My, my, as I said, my instinct is to say make the make the tracks simpler and a little mm. bit more pure, and then make it about the riders controlling the bikes, not these wacky obstacles. That's my instinct as a, as sort of a. Whatever, but you like don't said, think Black you don't think it requires kind of... the rider to control the bike to be able to get through the wacky obstacle. I think that you, when obstacles become difficult, they reach a certain amount of difficulty, and and riders just go for it. That's what that's my impression. That's what I think. That that's I think they just get to a point where they're like, all right, well, I got to just go for it and and hope that I clear yeah, the jump. Because if I don't, that he's going to go it. for it, and then he's going to yep. win. Exactly. So I have no choice. Exactly. Yeah. So that's my instinct is to say, just you know make make the whoop section uh simpler and if riders go through it faster fine but if they're also less likely to crash that might be better for the spectator and better for riders not getting hurt yeah. but in general do i think that it's that it's quote unquote too difficult right no yeah, i think yeah. that they're pro level riders and they should if they're getting hurt they just need to slow down <laughs> sorry that's the answer you know like you gotta you gotta measure your your mm-hmm. pace same as everyone else does so yeah. Uh, so Spurgeon Dunbar, you get the final yeah, word. Yeah. What about you? Answering all those questions. Favorite off-road type of racing to watch, favorite one to compete in, and is Supercross too difficult? So uh, when I'm not watching motocross with my grandmother, um, <laughs> shout out to <laughs> Nana, um, I would say that like I do I do like watching – I like watching um, probably the, the hard enduro stuff is, is the stuff that I, I could sit down, I could put it on the TV, you know, crack a beer on a Saturday and, and just – be be blown away at the fact that like I could never do this. I do like riding yeah, off yeah. road. I've right. been I, I've done events with Brandon. Like there's there's you definitely times it so much more too because yes. you've gone through terrain that's similar, uh, just not on that scale. Right. So you're there's just like, there's stuff where like I think yeah. about some of the stuff that Brandon and I have done. Like whether it's the 24 hour race or some of the the enduros or, or some of the the terrain that we have. And like, there's been times where I'm like, this is impossible. <laughs> like, there's no way I'm gonna get this bike up this hill. It's pouring down rain. It's muddy and like. And you do it, and it's like cool. And you think that was hard. I am a real <laughs> badass. And then you watch what these people are doing at yeah. these events, and it's just like I have no idea. I have no idea how you do it. So I think from yeah. a watching standpoint, hard enduro I, I do enjoy quite a bit. And I and I and it's easy to watch too, right? Like you yeah. can find it. You can usually watch it after the fact, and it's right. it's it's nice and and fun to watch. From a participation standpoint. You know, I've done like the 24 hour races with Brandon. Um, I would like to probably get a little bit more into like hair scramble enduros, the timekeeping thing. I would probably tackle it the same way Brandon does. Uh, I probably wouldn't worry too much about the timekeeping and just, you know, <laughs> just try to get fun. through it. Yeah. Yeah. But I would say that um, what I would like to get back into more of is maybe even uh, a rally race at some point. You know, and, and I think back to, I had done this ride where they kept saying it wasn't a race, but it was this event up in Canada called The Longest Day. And you had to do, um, it was like 550 miles the first year that I did it. And I've talked about this in the podcast before, and you had to do it on an adventure bike. And it was it was like all in one direction. You had to navigate. It was very much like a one-day rally race. And we had a blast. Um, and then they made it so impossibly hard the second year because uh, I wrote some cocky article about how we beat Canada. Um, and then they we went back the second year and they made it <laughs> extremely hard and then nobody finished. So um, I, I like that kind of, of riding. So I would say hair scrambles, yes. Zach, I'd love to have you come out and do one. I would actually, yeah, unfortunately... I wanted to. I wanted to have uh, Zach, both you and Ari, come out and do the 24-hour ride with Brandon and I, and do our own team. Unfortunately, I think this year it overlaps with the Black Hills, and uh, I think you're going to uh, be possibly racing at Laguna. So I don't. I don't know if that's going to work out for this year, but maybe. Maybe in future years. And well, then, maybe a maybe a shorter one. You know, maybe not a 24-hour, yeah. but like a. I don't know. Have a long I, I, weekend. I, do a little hair scramble. All of us. We'd have. Yeah. A, Listen, have a great if time. you're yeah, not yeah. going to come out here and commit to racing 24 <laughs> hours straight with us, I don't know if <laughs> we're going to be able to do this. Time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and then has Supercross gotten too hard? Um, I thought about this a lot, right? Because when we're out, because you you're know, a professional. <laughs> no, I'm absolutely not a professional. But <laughs> in in a very unprofessional sense, uh, Brandon is a much faster rider than I am. My friend Jeff, my friend Jeff Canary that rides with Brandon and I, 
in in most cases is a faster rider than I am. The only time that I have a chance of keeping up with them or catching them is in the whoops because I've got these big old thick ham hawk <laughs> legs and like I can just I can outlast them and like my legs just don't get tired. Brandy's get, Brandy's got these skinny little chicken legs and like I can I can just push harder. So for me, in some cases, when I think about a much more amateur level, um, I like the whoops because it's a it's a bit more an advantage if you're good at them. Um, I think at this level, you know, Brandon, you were telling the story about when you walked the track at Supercross and oh, you're man. standing at the bottom of the whoop and you're and almost... And it's just like head level, basically. It's, I'm like... That's it's not so what gnarly. that's not what I'm talking about when I'm out with Brandon in the woods. Like, we're talking about <laughs> whoops that are maybe a foot or two high. The, the whoops that I'm talking about, I'm like, oh, yeah, they're fun. They're great. And then when you think about what these are, that these riders are actually going through... Um, but it's wild. to, to the yeah. point is, I agree with Zach. Like these are professional riders; they know the risk. Um, and, and honestly, I think the biggest thing with racing is like if you crash, you're out. Like you lose. So I think there's an acceptable risk of like you have to go through it fast enough to win. But if you go through it too fast, you're going to crash, and then you're going to probably yeah. blow your chances of winning anyway. Unless you're like toe so, Mac and come like from 19th yeah, but that's, to third or what? You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's always always super impressive when that happens. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I I uh, I hope at the very least, if you're still listening and you're still awake, um, that you um, <laughs> feel like you better understand all the different potential spectacles in off road racing, and um, and maybe you learned a thing or two about some some series that you can look up and check out. Um, and if you already knew about all this stuff, then you probably have lots of opinions of the stuff that we missed, forgot to talk about, yeah, didn't yeah. talk about, and you'll send us an email at highsidebillside at to tell us what we. Uh, what we failed to, to talk be about really to nice cover. i'm sure yeah yeah exactly <laughs> i'm sure all the emails will be super friendly address um, uh, just send all emails for this episode to brandon at <laughs> <laughs> yeah brandon.wise at... please no <laughs> uh yeah all right well i think um we got a couple viewer comments to um to run through here which is just some usual housekeeping stuff brandon so we can probably let you go but it's been it's been peachy keen having you on the podcast I oh hope yeah you had fun man it was a great time thanks so much for having me guys this is uh this has been really great this is my for- forte you know the old dirt <laughs> god made dirt yeah. don't hurt oh so, my lord <laughs> god made dirt <laughs> it all right. hurts all right thanks guys love it see you brandon we'll get you next time yeah see you see you man so hopefully you all have learned a little bit of something uh about off-road racing maybe a historical fact or whether or not brandon thinks supercross has gotten too difficult uh, but if you didn't learn anything about off-road racing you almost certainly learned something about brandon wise yeah, so you're welcome there you go so let's move <laughs> on to high side low side comments these are the comments that you have left for us on youtube you've sent us an email to high side low side at revzilla.com uh or you know I don't know. Where else are we getting comments from? Sometimes they come on social media all over the place. But this one came from email. Uh, Simon wrote in and said, Good evening, Spurge and Zach. My Africa twin handles great by myself, but with my fiance on the on the height and uh well basically he puts his fiance on the back <laughs> and it, it changes the way the suspension handles is what I, is what he's saying here. Um that is that's a good paraphrase. Just to just to clarify one direct quote though. He said with his fiance on the back, blah, 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 um, ruins the handling. And then the when he adds luggage in, it's even worse, not to mention that the yep. saddlebag is uncomfortable uh, for his fiance after a couple of hours. Uh, I would like to get a lot more riding if I had something that handled better with a passenger, uh, better for sporty, twisty roads with buddies, uh, was leaning towards an S1000XR. But after hearing uh, us talk about it, feels that it might be a little bit high strung, would appreciate insight. Zach. What do you think? Well, a couple things. One, adding a passenger is always going to ruin the handling of a motorcycle. I mean, not always going to ruin it. That's an exaggeration. But it's always going to get worse. You're going to add weight to a bike. And an Africa Twin is kind of a tall, top-heavy bike anyway. 21-inch front wheel for going off-road. A little bit of a soft so, suspension, too, compared to something yeah, like an S1000 XR. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Yep, yep. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's something that Simon should 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 come around to if he has not already that it will make this the handling worse of the motorcycle adding adding a passenger i think the way to in in stock form the only way to really avoid or the way to lessen the impact of having a passenger on there is to have a bike that's bigger to begin with like if you put a passenger on the back of an africa twin you're going to notice a big difference if you put a passenger on the back of a gold wing 
less so because the gold wing is sort of like already designed to be it's already huge anyway and it's designed to have a lot of weight back there so um the shock preload is ready for it that kind of thing what about you Spurge? i would say that you know first and foremost the africa twin is probably i so simon didn't tell us how much he weighs uh or how much his fiance weighs and that's fine no, i don't want to know personal information yep. Yep, yep um but what i would say is that i'm guessing that the africa twin might be undersprung just for simon's weight to begin with and then when you throw passenger and luggage on there uh you know it's now a bike that's just right. not set up to handle that kind of weight so typically you want to you want to get uh springs for your motorcycle suspension to match the way you ride it most of the time so if you're only riding your Africa Twin, your passenger, in theory, you could put very heavy springs on there and get it to work very well. But the problem is then, if you're not riding with a passenger, the bike's going to be unrideably stiff. So what I would recommend is, if you like the Africa Twin otherwise, you know, you could go ahead and, and you know, maybe get some, some slightly stiffer springs on there, play around with the preload. But what's cool about something like the S1000XR or even like an R1250 you know, GS, and I'm not sure if the XR has the electronic suspension. I think it does, but it does, when, yeah, you, yeah. when you get into uh, these so bikes... So does an Africa Twin Adventure Sports, If you actually. get one of the new ones, yep. But mm -hmm. um, that's that's where, you know, with something like that, Simon, you could easily scroll through and say, I want, you know, uh, the two-helmet picture from BMW or the two helmets with the <laughs> luggage bag from BMW, and that will automatically adjust the preload for you so you don't have to do that every time your fiancé gets on and off. However... Do you think the S one thousand XR is going to be too high strung? I don't. I don't know what your exact riding style is, um, Simon. I would definitely recommend trying to test ride one because it is a completely different machine than the Africa Twin that you're currently on. Would you yeah, say that's and not? I think that that's not accurate. I think that's accurate. Yeah. Yep, it is very different, and it is you know definitely more high strung than an Africa Twin. That's for sure. Um, I think that. Uh, yeah, ask yourself what kind of bike you want to ride. If you want some, if you're just doing road riding and you just sort of like the look of the upright adventure, ad, adventure style bike, um, then yeah, something like an S1000XR or a Versus 1000 from Kawasaki. That's a, uh, not as, uh, not as performance oriented, not as high strung as an S1000XR, but it does have, um, electronic, some electronic suspension capability and it has 17 inch wheels, which will keep it presumably be a, a little bit more nimble when, uh, your fiance soon to be wife is on the back. I would say um, I would say you know the bike that I was thinking about for Simon was an R1250 GS. I think what I like about the idea of bumping from the Africa Twin to the R1250 um, it's going to yep. get a little bit more power. He's still going to maintain yep. the download torque uh, that he's probably accustomed to a little bit with Certainly. that Africa Twin. Yep. Um, yep. And and I think he would be very impressed with what the upgrade that would provide. So my advice to you Simon is to test ride as many bikes as you can but don't don't shy away from an R1250 GS as opposed to jumping to the right. S1000XR. Or an R1200. The previous generation sure. will, 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 yep. have, will have, still has electronic suspension options as well. And great bike, handles really well. Slightly smaller front wheel, so you, you might get slightly better feedback and handling on, on road. Compared to an Africa Twin. Hopefully that helps. A Simon. smaller front wheel compared to an Africa Twin, not compared yes. to an S1000XR. Don't confuse that. Correct. Yep. Correct. Yep, thank you for the clarification. Well, hopefully that helps, Simon. Uh, thank you so much for the letter. Next up, we got uh, an email from Justin, um, who uh, seems to enjoy the High Side, Low Side podcast. Um, so actually, said he feels like he's part of our community and that it feels good. Well, you know what, Justin? You are part of our community. Yeah. Anyone who's listening to the High Side, Low Side is part of the The High Side, Low Side family, baby. All right. Indeed. So Justin says, speaking of uh, Kawasaki versus 1000, uh, Justin says he has uh, he regularly rides a 2019 versus 1000 for long distances. And as someone who came down from uh, a long line of American style cruisers and tours, I feel like the power of the versus uh, could very well get the best of me. In other words, it seems like it's it's pretty fast when you really uh, ask it to get up and go, which is uh, which is fair. It's true. Um, all that being said, I use rain mode when conditions merit. Do I need it? Is his question. Uh, uh, does it add safety? Is it is it is it doing anything basically? That seems like the gist of the question here, right? Spurge? Yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm taking away from Justin's email. Um, is you know. What what am I what am I doing here? And honestly, what I've found with rain mode in most cases, and I'm not 100% sure with how it works on the Versys 1000. Um, I did ride that bike, and I think with this bike, it doesn't have any effect on the power the way that the my my 1090 did. Like my 1090 in rain mode actually changed the top horsepower from like 125 down to like 100. I'm not sure if the I, Versys does that or if it just changes the throttle response. 
I think it does change total power output. I believe late model Kawasaki's now, they've trickled down the technology they used to only have on the ZX-10, which is to have a full power mode and a low power mode. Um, so I think rain does, I believe, uh, decrease the, the power. Um, but if it doesn't do that, then to Spurgeon's point, it will it will just make the throttle response less sharp. Yeah. So that you you when you when you the same amount of throttle uh, uh, t- gri- uh, throttle grip twist will result in slightly less ask from the engine. Yeah. So to to your and oh go ahead. Oh, no go no go go for it. I was gonna say um, I don't remember the specifics of the 2019 versus 1000 uh, uh, system, but often what it also does is change the. Uh, depending on the bike, it changes the parameters of ABS and traction control as well. So it will decide that, um, it, you put it in rain mode and it'll say, okay, well now our ABS is going to be extra cautious and traction control is going to be extra cautious. And the throttle response is throttle response, excuse me, is going to be, um, not delayed, but, but, um, but just sort of toned down a little bit. So in all these senses, when you tell the bike that it's raining, you, yeah, you, you do, it does change it changes the, the way the systems are, are prepared to help you. And the other thing to keep in mind, too, in 2019 with this bike, uh, I believe they did introduce the IMU with this. So all of those safety men- mm-hmm. mentions that Zach just threw out there are now going to be engaged uh, at different lean angles, right? So if you're... Right. If, all those systems are going to be informed by the lean angle sensor. Correct. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you yep. for the clarity there. So, you know, if you're, if you're, even if it's bone dry out and you're leaned over in a turn and you whack open the throttle very aggressively, um, that traction control isn't going to let the rear wheel just completely spin out of control and kick out on you. And that gets back to, I think, really, you know, the heart of Justin's question here, coming from a V twin segment jumping to a bike that makes a lot more power, you know, how to, how to help, you know, retard some of that power so that it's not, it's not threatening. And I think that's where for a lot of people starting in rain mode is a, is a great option. I know I've mentioned on the podcast before, but when I was doing um, track days at uh, California Superbike school, I would leave the bike in rain mode for the first half of the day to really get a feel for what having, you know, a, a 1000 CC, you know, 190 plus or hundred and whatever plus horsepower motorcycle <laughs> is out there yeah. depending on the generation. And it, it was cool because in that particular bike, it only r- retarded power when you're at lean angle. And then when you're up, you could come on to full power and it helped you really figure that bike out in smooth transitions. And then you could go and, and change over to sport track race modes later on. Um, so it's definitely a tool that I think you can help, that can help you learn to, uh, you know, experience your motorcycle. And as you get better at it and you want to change, you know, the, the throttle inputs and such, you can work your way up through the, through the settings. Yep. Yep. That's all, all very well said indeed. So yeah, I think it's a, it's the right thing to do. Um, but the most important thing I think about this question that Justin asked is that it's clear that he is thinking critically about uh, his demeanor and how the bike reacts in these scenarios, because that's, uh, that, that's the most important thing. And congratulations on getting into a new segment of motorcycling. I think that's always yeah. exciting to step away from Good something point. that you're familiar with and get into a new segment <laughs> of riding, I think is exciting. So for any of you out Good there that are point. listening that have a question or a comment or a concern for uh, Zachary and myself, you can always leave us a YouTube comment or you can shoot us an email to highside, lowside at ribzilla.com. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. And Zach, if you wanted to leave us a review of the podcast because you love what you're hearing, where where could someone leave a review for the podcast that would do a lot of good for us? They could go to Apple Podcasts and leave uh, a review between five and ten stars. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, uh, yeah, and and as a friendly reminder, if you leave uh, a review for us on Apple Podcasts, um, we will pick one. Uh, each time we do the show and give away a t-shirt to that person. This time around, the winner was Sean F. Is that right? Ah, uh, question mark? Uh, yeah, Sean, Sean F. F. Question mark? Leave us uh, or shoot us an email, Sean, uh, with your uh, address and t-shirt information, and we will get one sent out for you. And I think that about wraps it up, Mr. Quartz. I think we are ready to bid the audience adieu until next time and say thank you for joining us for this episode of High Side, Low Side. But... We're ready to we're ready to go sign off and go ride some motorcycles. It's a Friday here in podcasting land, and we're going to get out there and have some fun. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. See you next time.